Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, let's see, what all happened there? Uh, thanks to Lee Overstreet for filling in last week uh, while Tom was away. we gotta got to say I thanks to Lee. I still haven't blocked on Facebook. Blocked on Facebook too much? Uh... I block them at football season. Once he starts posting Roll Tide crap, <laughs> That's I what start it is. blocking them. <laughs> too so much every, crimson. I snooze them. I snooze him for 30, 30 days, and, <laughs> and then he, he just popped up, like, this weekend. And my wife was sitting next to me. I said, you see this? And yep. she's like, this roll tie thing? I'm like, yep. And she saw me do the drop-down menu. She saw me snooze it for 30 days. I'm like, as long as Bam is still in the running, I got I to gotta keep doing this. So Indeed. I'm out. Well, there was that. Uh, let's see. As we're recording this, it is uh, Election Day in the USA. So it hopefully, is. if you live in the United States and are eligible to vote there you went out and did so it is very important to exercise your democratic rights to vote and uh yeah i guess i'll just say quick updates from uh my place these photos were as of the weekend and they're actually a little bit out of date uh carpet is installed now there was a little delay in getting things uh done on the flooring side of things there was more leveling necessary uh than originally anticipated which is like both anticipated and not anticipated, uh, if you get what I mean, as far as the plans, original plans went, but I'm not surprised that it turned out to be necessary. Uh, it was also exceedingly uh, like damp over uh, when they were putting it in on the uh, Thursday last week, so it didn't dry by Friday, which meant they, you know, they're not installing the laminate until uh, yesterday and today, Monday and Tuesday, as we're recording this. So yeah, that's uh, what's been going on over at my place. Things are progressing. You're not seeing the carpet installed in the photos, because like I say, I took that on the weekend, and uh, carpet is in there now. So nice to see that uh, things are moving along a little bit, but uh, yep, had a delay. Probably not going to be in there on November the 18th when they said, which means it'll be slightly more than the six weeks I was optimistically projecting. But, you know, yeah. fingers crossed. Uh, as you probably know from the title of the podcast i'm going to talk about a couple of headphone reviews here Mm -hmm. in a second but before we do that let's talk about uh what we watched uh rob what did you watch uh i two weeks i guess or week yeah just this past week i watched spencer uh that is the Kristen stewart starring uh story about princess diana um Ah. it is following just a single christmas weekend that's it's just a little snippet out of her life um right around the time just before she and Prince Charles were divorced, but when it was just becoming known to the public that, you know, he was uh, having an affair with Camilla and all that. So that's that's the weekend that they decided to cover there. Uh, some really good performances. I can see why there was, you know, Oscar buzz around not just Kristen Stewart's performance, which, yeah, this is definitely the best acting I've seen her do. I, you know, I'm not uh, someone who speaks English from England. I don't know how good or bad her accent really was, but she seemed pretty good in, in most of the areas. There were definitely some places where just kind of lapsed into her American accent in a couple of scenes, which I always find weird in movies. I'm like, really? Couldn't have done another take? Nobody heard that. Uh, but uh, overall, uh, I thought her performance was really good. Maybe there were other takes and they just weren't as good. Yeah, yeah, it could be that. Uh, they definitely focused on um, her outfits. That was like a, a tremendous focus of this movie was was having outfits that, you know, looked exactly like things that uh, Princess Di was, was photographed wearing. Um, but on a technical side, uh, watch this on Amazon Prime Video. It was not coming in in HDR, so I was watching an SDR presentation of it, which was very low in contrast. Like, you know, SDR doesn't have to be that low in contrast. This was very low in contrast. I'm not sure if that's Amazon Prime Video to blame or if that's simply the way the movie was shot. It's not that the black levels were artificially raised because when there were fades to black or, you know, full on things that were obscured, it was it was pure inky black on my parents' OLED, which is the way I'm watching things these days. Uh, but yeah, when they had, you know, shadow detail and stuff like that, it was it was pretty, pretty murky gray instead of black going on there. So uh, on a technical level, it was that. I also found it amusing that the aspect ratio, and I looked it up just to make sure this wasn't an Amazon Prime Video thing, but according to uh, IMDb's technical specs for when the movie was re- released theatrically, uh, it was a 1.66 to 1 aspect ratio, which means it is slightly more square than our 16 by 9, that's 1.78 to 1. So 1.66 to 1 uh, had black bars on the left and right side. So uh, I just found it 
uh, interesting that they went for a slightly more square shape. Although, as Tom has alluded to in storytelling, it made sense here because they were very much focusing on people's faces. It was a lot mm. of close-ups on people's faces, so they have that tighter framing so that we're focused on the people's face instead of anything that's going on in the background. Uh, you know, and having that wider aspect ratio if you were focused more on the setting than you were on just the faces. So, uh, interesting choice there on on a technical level. And yeah, I I give the movie a thumbs up. It's it's certainly a bit depressing. Uh, it certainly casts Princess Di in a very sympathetic light. Um, sure. So, you know, it that... would be hard to do a movie about Princess Di, <laughs> even if it was realistic, even if it was like dead on accurate. Right. Where, I mean, she's just too beloved, apparently. Oh, yeah. To... And I mean, this is not meant to be. Uh, like right at the beginning, they put up a text that says, this is a fable based on true events. So they're not yeah. trying to be literal one for one. This is exactly what was said or anything like that. Uh, they, they say right up front, this is a fable. This is a fictionalized version. Uh, the two boys who played uh, William and Harry, really, really good. Uh, so uh, enjoyed their performances quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So the only thing I watched that was new, I, I did watch something else like the week before I missed and I remember thinking to myself, I should write this down because I'm going to forget I watched this. <laughs> and I did, mm. and I don't know what it is. Mm. So I watched something, and maybe they'll, maybe someday we'll say, I'll say, oh, I think I've seen that. And that that was the week that that was this what this week. Um, I also watched the new Hellraiser on Hulu, which is probably on Crave or whatever you guys have over. Okay, there. is that a series or is that a movie? No, it's a movie. It's a movie. Okay, it's a movie. It's a uh, one. It's a it's a you know, reinvention, I guess, or, you know, reboot of okay. the whole thing. This is the one uh, where Pinhead is detected, uh, depicted as female, right? She is female. Yeah. Okay. They, they are female. I, I don't really know that gender applies to these things. No, not really. They definitely really. don't seem to have genitalia because they're mostly naked in this. And as far as clearly, secondary cle features goes, appears more feminine uh, yes. version of Pinhead there. Uh. I am starting to believe that there are no horror movies anymore. Uh -huh. Like this, this was not scary. Like it wasn't even all that gross. Huh. Like compared to the first, like the first Hellraiser, you know, I saw when I was young, and and of course it's going to be completely. I'm a d different person, and I have a lot more experiences, and you know, there was a lot more you know torture porn now than there ever were right. was back then. So there's um. And I mean that in the sense of horror movies, not in some sort of weird sense. I don't know if you guys. Have I think ever it heard applies in all senses these days, Tom. As far as what can be found on the internet, <laughs> <laughs> that's not what I was referring to. I was referring to like movies like uh, Hostel and stuff like sure. that, which are saw. often referred to as yeah, saw as torture porn. Um, I, uh, you know, I just, I, I, I just found it completely blasé. I was oh, bored. Now I did, I did watch like the first maybe 20 30 minutes of it in like four or five little blocks mm -hmm. because uh i was watching it as people were not in the room because nobody wants to watch it with me so um but i did watch the last at least the last half of the movie all together okay and you know there were some interesting things like like some interesting ideas it just wasn't scary mm. at all anything notable on a technical level He's thinking no. hard. That means no. No, no not really. <laughs> not really. Sorry. I, I, my wife My wife was like, what's this John Wick movie? I'm like, you have said the wrong words to me. So mm. we watched John Wick. And let me tell you, I did not warn her about that dog, and she was not happy about oh. that dog. Yeah, if you don't so, know going in, that's, that's going to be a, did they really just, did they? Yep. Okay, yep. kill all these people. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's very. Uh, I don't know that, that she loved the movie, but I enjoyed myself immensely. <laughs> so there's that. All right, uh, let's talk about some uh, some headphones. I did. There's been two headphone reviews that have shown up on AV Gadgets in the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, the first was the Earfun Air S uh, headphones. These are I would call them budget. Uh, Fully wireless Bluetooth headphones, uh, ANC, you know, other those uh, uh, noise canceling. The noise canceling, mm -hmm. you know, these are these have all the features, okay. And uh, for those that are looking for, like, I like these headphones. It may not come across totally in the review, but I very much like these headphones because they are they are, they did two things. One, they are they are fine to listen to. They are inoffensive they are the kind of headphones that you listen to and you're like this might not be totally accurate 
but they're they they sound good. So they have okay. a a bit of a high end. Uh, I'm sorry, a very low end bass boost. So they thump. They have a, a bit of a thump. Like you feel like you should feel the bass when you're listening to these things, almost at any volume. They do have an EQ in there. They have an app and everything else. They do have an EQ in the app, but the EQ doesn't go low enough to correct that low end. <laughs> I see. Bump. You know, I think it goes down like 63 hertz or something like that. And who knows how much it actually does. But uh, so they have this like built in bass boost at the very, very bottom. And that gives them this sort of like bumpiness that I found to be, you know, per- perfectly acceptable. You know, mm-hmm. it seemed, you know, very much. Um, a pleasant headphone to listen to if you're listening to music and you're working out or you're doing yard work or you're just you know doing stuff around the house right you're not critical listening these headphones i felt were really good plus the shape of the little wand that comes out of them had a a little bit of a a a flat side to it like right now Mm -hmm. everything seems to be round like they, because the the iPods are round so everything's or what do they call it they call iPods Uh, airpods AirPods. For the earphones. The AirPods are round, so everything else has got to be round. Well, with round, you don't really have the right leverage to, like, put them in and then twist. Because you're mm-hmm. supposed to put them in and then twist a little bit to get mm-hmm. them into shape. With this one flat side, at the at, if you're – and when they're in your ear, it's, like, facing towards you and away from you, the flat side. And it's sort of rounded, facing out away from your head. Mm-hmm. Uh that flat side gives you just the right amount of grip where you can put them in and they just go in super easy, hmm. which I really, really like. Yeah, if you're uh, they, not looking at any of the images on YouTube or in our Flickr album, these do have a shape very reminiscent of Apple's AirPods. If you're trying to picture what these are, these are fully wireless, come with right. a case that uh, can also be used to charge they're all them like up. This. Yeah. They're, they're just about all like this these yeah. days. All right. Uh, so there's like 70 bucks or less. Uh, you know, you can find them on, they're already on sale. Um, and I did get a note back. I, I sent the, the review to the marketing company, whoever the heck sent me the thing. Mm-hmm. I don't remember who it is. And they, they were like, oh, we're going to send this along to our engineers. I'm like, no, you're not. Shut up. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I mean, All maybe right? they will. I haven't heard of this brand. So, you know, maybe I they're... haven't either. And I mean, there's so many of them out there that it's like. You know, they really don't do in. They have like all the features, mm-hmm. like you know, low latency and, and I think Bluetooth five point two mm-hmm. and you know, uh, like the ANC, the transparent mode, and none of it's done very well. I mean, I none of it is none of it is great. Mm. Like, just put them in normal mode and don't mess with the EQ too much because it doesn't really do that much anyways. Mm-hmm. And then go on with your life. These are just pretty nice sounding headphones that go in and out of your ears really easily, which I think is. For me, good enough. Okay. Good enough for this price point. Uh, the second set of headphones I'm going to talk about are the Soundcore Sleep A10 wireless earbuds. These are from Anchor. And um, Soundcore is from, from Anchor. Mm-hmm. And uh, these were sent to me. The, the, I got an announcement about these before they were ever released. And I it was actually before Ian, a Hurricane Ian, came rolling through. Ah, okay. Uh, they were actually supposed to arrive the day that Ian hit. And they delayed the, 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 the shipment because of, of the storm. Mm. Uh, so we got those in, and I told them, I'm like, listen, you can send them to me, but I'm not reviewing them. I'm giving them to my wife because she doesn't sleep well. She's never slept well. She's uh, she's not never. Let's not. Pretty much since our kids have got old enough for her to worry about them, she has not slept well. <laughs> so, you know, we have like an – I've told, talked about this on the iPad, on the, uh, the podcast. We've got an iPad that's like – gen 2 that mm-hmm. does nothing but play white noise in there it's mm. on constantly it always sounds like it's raining in my bedroom so uh i told my wife about these 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 earbuds and they're um, they are supposed to be worn while you're sleeping now i don't know about you but they i have never th- worn earbuds and thought to myself well i can't wait to go to sleep with these in my face because <laughs> they're gonna fall out they're not very comfortable and uh usually because you know i mean they have the whole you know, they friction fit, right? Mm-hmm. They go in there. You have to, like, stick them in your ear canal, and they're just not very good. Uh, but these are supposed to be to, to be used while sleeping. I'm like, you can send them to me. I'm giving them to my wife. She doesn't like earbuds, <laughs> like, at all. Okay. Like, she, she makes me buy her the the the, the, the wireless uh, headphones that have, like, the loop that goes around your ear sure. so that she doesn't have to stick them in her ear. Mm. 
Okay, and she doesn't say she doesn't care a, a lick about sound quality. Okay, like that's never going to factor. So I mean, her, once but... again, just for people who aren't looking at any photos, these are the fully wireless uh, style. Now these ones, rather than having the stem that is sticking down and would you know be something that you would end up lying on if you laid down sideways on your ear, uh, these have sort of like a little I would imagine silicone uh, loop yeah. that uh, sort of snugs them. Like an ear with, loop. Yeah, yeah. inside inside the crevice of the mm -hmm. uh, pinna of your ear, and then they're very low profile so that if you're lying oh down God. on the side of your head nothing is sticking out they're freaking tiny mm. they are in like i got them i was like these are nuts they're so so small yeah so, I mean, so being um, tiny my worry would be battery that would worry with being so well small. yes and that was in fact that was my wife's first complaint she's like they die they okay. die immediately and i was like okay so we you know the thing I found out about these headphones is that they are complex. Mm. They are a complex device because they are not really meant to be full-fledged headphones. Like, you can't take calls on these things. Okay. You can, but they don't have a microphone. <laughs> so ah, yes. you can't, you can't risk, but you have to have, you have to talk to the phone still. So, I mean, why take them? So, uh, <laughs> these are really meant to be used just for this whole sleeping thing. You can use them from other stuff. They don't have, uh, uh, active noise canceling okay. at all because that's battery draining, right? Sure so is, they yeah. just they just have the they just have the go into your ear canal and they can block out like 35 dB of noise is what they're kind of rated to, which mm -hmm. is pretty good. Uh, but then you can download to these things your choice of uh, like a white noise something like rain or water or wind or rainforest or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you can download it. In fact, you, you can choose one of theirs or you can get your own and download it from wherever source you have. But it goes into the ear the, the earbuds so they are no longer connected to your phone at some point. Okay, so you put these in your ears, you turn that on, and now they're not they're not Bluetooth connected, which extends their battery life. Mm -hmm. So the battery life on these things while connected to your phone is supposed to be six hours. Okay. I don't know how much it actually is, but that's pretty typical for any earbud like all the earbuds and earphones i have it are is, all six yeah. hours yeah that's that's the same like i was surprised it was so long and again these With have a case that you charge so you charge the case and then you can put the little earbuds inside of the case yeah. to charge them i think they i think you get like 30 total hours out of the case okay. you know but you have to put them back so i'm talking about like in your ear how long will they last yeah. six to ten hours depending on how you're using them uh ten, and it's 10 hours with just the, just using the white noise that's going on hmm. From the earbuds themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, they have insane amounts of features that go on with these things. Like, uh, uh, they have a sleep sensor. So, it will, it, you can stream. This is what my wife does. She streams a podcast, like the most boring podcast you can think of. Like, she searches for <laughs> boring podcasts. <laughs> and uh, she starts the bar boring podcast. And then when it senses her, uh, that, she, that senses that she's falling asleep or she has just fallen asleep, it switches to the white noise. Hmm. And when it sense, when they sense that you, you are actually fully asleep, it turns off. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Okay. They do have some capacitive touch stuff, but my wife doesn't know how to use it, so she doesn't use it. But you can turn them back on if you wake up. So okay. when you wake up, you can turn, you can start the whole process over again by tapping on them or double tapping. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It, it's all in the 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 on their website. They have an FAQ that has a bajillion like videos and everything else to show you how to use these things because it is complex. So my wife was like, "Oh, they're dead." I'm like, yeah, but it has an alarm built in too, right? So there's there's a built-in alarm that goes off when you uh, to wake you up, so mm. that it doesn't wake up your your partner. Mm -hmm. She's like, yeah, the, the alarm still goes off. I'm like, well, then they're not dead. Mm -hmm. They're not dead if they're waking you up. But one time it didn't wake her up. Mm. The alarm didn't go off. I now I am unsure if she just slept through it or if she, <laughs> you know, the or or if something else happened. But one time that she says the alarm didn't wake her up. And on that night, she was also using them for many hours because she was having a hard time falling asleep. Ah, right. So between the two, either she slept through it or it she killed them by using them too much. Hmm. I don't know. And plus, this was at the very beginning. And I, I don't think she had everything set up properly. So uh, these things are expensive. They're 180 bucks. Right. They're not, they're not cheap. But like I, the, the preface of this whole thing was my wife doesn't like in-ear earbuds she doesn't like you know she she's you know this idea of having something in your she loves them 
Hmm. She sleeps with them every. She can't. In fact, she lost the case the other day with them in it because she was walking around the house and just set it down someplace. Yeah. And we had to tear this house apart looking for them. <laughs> they were in the. They were like in the kids' bathroom. She's like, "How are they getting here?" I'm like, "Lady, ain't nobody touched them but you." So yeah, you put them in there, and we don't know why. So, uh, she loves them. She sleeps with them every night now, hmm. and. Uh, it, it is going to take like you're going if you get these if you get these and you start using them if you're like oh it's doing something funny go back to the FAQ right on the on the Soundcore website because it, it is a lot more nuanced the control of these things are a lot more nuanced than you think they are hmm. um, also like when you go into sleep mode and stuff like that it has all these different things that they can do you know it's it's really quite powerful so uh, the hundred eighty dollars. For me, like, I think it, it, if you are having a hard time sleeping and you're the kind of person who wants white noise and, you know, needs needs something else to listen to. And, you know, the, the thing that she has is she would fall asleep to the podcast, but then something would happen on the podcast that would wake her sure, up. Sure, yeah. And this absolutely eliminated that. Mm. And that's why she loves them. So uh, if you're the kind of person that this or you're like, oh, my God, that sounds great. You should fork over this $180. Sure. And and give these a try because they are quite good, but they they do have a bit of a learning a, okay. a learning curve. Like they do what they say, and I'm so impressed. I am really impressed by these by the the Sleep A10s because I was I was as skeptical as you could get. Right. Like, and I, and I, <laughs> like not only was I skeptical, but I was giving them to somebody that I was sure was going to hate them, and. It just the the review couldn't have gone better. Hmm. It's really I was very impressed with how the, how they worked out. I thought she would wear them once and that would be it. I also thought she would lose them, which she did <laughs> that one time. But she also had you know I thought they would fall out of her ear. They only fell out once or twice in the month that she was testing them hmm. before I wrote the review. And I mean I was like okay you're, you it's going to be lost, but. It's not lost. It's in the bed someplace. Yeah. You just have to. You just have to be careful when you're taking the. You know, go through the sheets and you find it. Since they're so a you, white color, if you have non-white colored sheets, that might help. Yes, and <laughs> they probably have other colors too. I don't even know, but really quite good. So check out those. Uh, the ear funds are good. Sort of like these are the ones I would give my kids. They have low, a low latency gaming mode, and they're not going to care about the rest of that. And the extra base is something they're going to like. If you have a hard time sleeping, you have a loved one who has a hard time sleeping. The Soundcore Sleep A10s are kind of amazing <laughs> so i would I, I would definitely recommend those so all right let's get to this podcast uh, the yeah. av ramp podcast is a podcast that answers your home theater and av questions to get your questions answered all you have to do is ask you ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com you can go to our website, uh, AV Rant, to see our uh, previous episodes, our show notes, with along with Flickr albums. So if you hear us talking about images and stuff, uh, you can see those on the YouTube page, or you can at, while the the video is playing, or you can go to uh, AV Rant and you'll see the on the show notes there'll be a Flickr album that you can follow along with. Uh, let me see, uh, Facebook.com slash AV Rant Podcast, YouTube.com slash AV Rant. Contact us directly, Rob at AVRant.com. Are we still doing Twitter, Rob? Is that still a thing? <laughs> I mean, I, I haven't deleted my account, so yeah, you can still contact me I don't plan on deleting my account. I, I figure he already, and by he, I mean, of course, I mean Elon Musk. There, <laughs> Anybody who's watching the not even slow motion train wreck that is Indeed. Twitter these days do, does understand that any piece of data that you put into Twitter that they still have access to, he is absolutely going to sell to try to make back whatever sure. money he can because he is on, he, I mean, I... He may be completely bankrupt by the end. So I have no idea what's going to happen with this whole thing. I'm like, I'm not a financial whiz or whatever, but I'm like, you just bought something for a whole bunch of money that has never made money. It has never made money. Yeah, Twitter was I, not I, a profitable money making venture, <laughs> and then he overpaid what its stock value was worth, basically just to own them. Like, I, I don't mean literally own them, just to own them, to pwn them, uh, with yes. like the whole thing that was going on. And yeah, it's good. Yes. we're watching it happen. So I will inside. say, uh, yeah, like if you notice that AV Gadgets and AV Rants are no longer po posting on uh, Twitter, <laughs> do not be shocked. Yeah, right. Okay? I just, I, 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 there's a lot of reasons why brands are pulling out of, uh -huh. and it's not because of liberals or whatever. It's just because <laughs> no one wants to have their, their content right next to a, a, a 
a fire hose stream of racist, misogynistic, transphobic crap coming out of you know a, a very small minority of people who Indeed. apparently have nothing else to do. So <laughs> for now, Rob's Twitter is at is at First Reflect. You can contact me directly, Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom, which the, the only thing you been able to really find on there for years has been the post of this yes <laughs> this is <a> podcast episode <laughs> if that you see that not showing up anymore don't be shocked that's all i'm saying uh thank our listeners of the week to become a listener of the week all i have to do is support the podcast in some way one of the ways you can do that is going to patreon.com slash podcast where you can sign up to be a patron uh patreon's a service where every month they take uh, some money from you and give most of it to us so we want to thank Andy, as well as uh, all of our 139 patrons over at Patreon.com. So we have 139 total. One of them's Andy. Thank you very much. All yes, you. indeed. That is Patreon.com slash AV Rant Podcast. If you'd like to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation. So big, big thanks to our 139 patrons over there. Andy, thank you for being one of them. All right. We also got some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going or just for the podcast from uh jay who shared several movie recommendations uh after lee's request don't feed him <laughs> that was the whole thing don't don't feed lee all right jay nathan justin andy Alongo, julian daz who also sent movies jay, don't don't not for <laughs> lee bastion andrew more movie suggestions for lee lee go get your own podcast jerk <laughs> Mark, Julian, with more movie suggestions for Lee. And Grinder, who says, be warned, working with green glue can be messy. And also, Alabama sucks. He said it. He says, <laughs> says it right there. Yeah, it might be a little editorializing happening there, but I will just say the names once more. Thank you all for thanking us for keeping the podcast going through the times. So uh, Jay, Nathan, Justin, Andy, Alongo, Julian L., Daz, Bastion, Andrew, Mark, Julian H., and Gurinder. Uh, really appreciate oh, those notes that you great. sent in there. Thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. And uh, yeah, uh, nice of those folks uh, who, who sent those suggestions to Lee after he uh, he requested them. He He's, uh, you know, really, really uh, pushing for that uh, Lee at avrant.com email address. You know, that's Is he where, really? That's where he wants yeah. those things sent. Yeah. I was saying, don't hey. hold your breath, Lee. And I, <laughs> I think I was right. <laughs> you're going to have to you're gonna have to calm down on the whole Bama crap. I will say they <laughs> lost to LSU. I mean, how did that feel? Because it couldn't have felt good. Because <laughs> LSU, my dad's a huge LSU fan, and, and all he cares about is that he, they beat uh, – Old Miss, mm -hmm. which I, apparently they did, and then the next week they beat Bama, and he's just over the moon. I'm like, <laughs> I don't care as long as Bama lost. I don't care who they lose to. In uh, the news, <laughs> PlayStation VR 2 has an official price and launch date, February uh, 22nd, 2023, for $550. That's $50 more than the PS PS5 console with a disc drive, and $150 more than the digital edition on the box. You'll get the new P, uh, PSVR 2 headset with its 20, I'm sorry, 2000 by 2040 resolution OLED, OLED screens per eye, HDR support, 120 hertz refresh rate, and eye tracking for foveated rendering, all with a single USB-C connection to your PS5 console. You also get a pair of Sony's new Sense controllers and a pair of wired earphones, but you don't get a you don't you don't get the the console, though, right? You have to Heavens have the console no. already? No, okay. you have to already have a PS5, which is $400 for the digital-only version or $500 for the disc version. Then the PlayStation VR headset and controllers and the little wired earphones is $550. So it is more than any version of the PlayStation 5 console. Interesting. For $600, you can get a bundle that includes a code for uh, Horizon Call of the Mountain and a charging stand to hold your controllers and headset uh, cost five, 50 bucks on top of that, whatever. I'm yeah, saying. if you want Pre it. If you want the stand so that you don't have to put a cable into your Sense controllers to charge them, you can just click them into the stand, which also has a place to uh, rest your uh, headset. And that's that's 50 bucks. Pre-orders start November 15th. Don't pre-order stuff. 
please please don't so i mean i was a bit surprised i didn't think they were going to price it more than the console itself i was thinking this was going to land at 450 dollars, right in between the price of the digital only edition or the disc edition of the consoles that was my prediction of what the price point was going to be so they they beat that by a hundred dollars more expensive um yeah that's 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 a bit spendy this was like i'm like if it was 450 dollars, i was prepared to pre-order this thing because i enjoy vr even though i don't have enough time to really use it nearly as much as i want oh, no. to I get a kick out of it at 550, which ends up being 750 Canadian dollars. Uh, this is a think twice about it for sure, which is too bad. Um, I was also really hoping that there would be maybe some mention of being able to watch 3D Blu-rays <laughs> because the original PlayStation VR on the PlayStation 4 uh, let you watch 3D Blu-rays inside the headset, and the 3D effect was excellent because you had zero crosstalk between your two eyes, and those were OLED screens in there, so the contrast was perfect. However, the resolution and the pentile layout of the uh, pixels in the original PlayStation VR made it so that, yeah, there was kind of a bit of a screen door effect going on while you were watching movies in there, because of course it wasn't taking up the entire uh, OLED screen in there. It was like a portion of it to make it look like you were looking at a movie screen inside of the headset. Now, this has much higher resolution, uh, doesn't use the pentile layout anymore uh, but as of right now the playstation 5 console the disc version of course uh, doesn't play back 3d blu-rays so i don't know if that was support will get added it shouldn't be something that would be that difficult to add via a firmware update but uh, i guess they really don't care about 3d blu-rays anymore but i was like you know i could kind of justify it i could i could you know put in a 77 inch or 83 inch oled instead of my 75 inch uh, z9d uh, television and maybe not worry about having a 3d tv anymore and and use the playstation vr2 as my 3d display but uh, might might not come to pass and it's a bit pricey i haven't picked up our oculus in months mm. months and you got I them before I their price picked... went up by 100 bucks so yeah yeah got some comments here from listeners suggestions for our listener greg with his jvc projectors weird replacement bulb issues where the old bulb works fine but is getting dim now and a new bulb whether in a new lamp housing or moved to the old housing re uh, results in a purple image after about 20 minutes nathan thinks it's all heat related and probably the loose ribbon cable that jvc mentioned he suggests putting the projector into high altitude mode so that it blasts the cooling fan just as a test if that lets the new bulb continue working without turning purple after 20 minutes, that likely indicates it is heat-related, so that's something Greg could also try. Mm -hmm. uh, if you'd like to spend uh, hundreds of dollars and be out of warranty anyway for an official repair, folks over at ABS Forum have posted a tutorial for opening up the JVC projector and checking that loose ribbon cable, so that would probably be worth a go, especially if Greg is already skilled enough to replace a bare bulb on his own, which we know he is. Checking the loose ribbon cable isn't any worse than doing the bulb change. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan, as well, wanted to make absolutely sure that the new bare bulb is an identical model number to the original that continues to work just fine. Does the bare bulb have a number on it that you could check with JVC? Not the entire lamp with housing, but just the bulb itself? Question mark. Mark suggested doing a full factory reset uh, on the projector to hopefully make sure it detects the new lamp as though it were a fresh out of the box original. And if there's any sort of lamp hour counter to make sure to reset that as well. And Carl suggests... Just be like him and replace your projector as soon as the latest new models come out every two to three years. Easy, says <laughs> Carl, in his disposable income. Yes. The, I mean, hey, when you, when you got the money, there are easy solutions out there. One of my favorite solutions when uh, the rug in my apartment got fairly dirty was uh, just to replace the entire rug. That was easier than cleaning it. Now, that costs more than just cleaning it, uh, but, you know, didn't take as much time, and uh, I had a brand new rug. So sometimes, if the, if the money isn't a problem, that is a solution. <laughs> get to some questions here nelson nelson is selling his place and while they are showing their home to potential buyers they didn't want any wires showing so he put his focal sib evo surround speakers in storage and just kept his focal core front speakers attached along with a single subwoofer making a 3.1 configuration with his denon x3600h receiver still in place it's fine but he'd like to have surround back he was hoping there might be an easy solution uh, to use a pair of small self-powered wireless speakers as temporary surrounds, but when he looks up wireless speakers, all he finds is Bluetooth speakers, and that don't seem to work with his Denon. So any suggestions? Um, I mean, you can use any speakers 
I mean, I have an article on AV gadgets on how to do this. But oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. I'll look it up real quick. You you answer. You answer your answer. Yeah. I mean, uh, I I wanted to point him to a product that we have mentioned on the a podcast before, but not for some time, uh, which is from a company called Amphony. A M P H uh, O N Y Amphony. Uh, it's their model eighteen hundred. Now it costs two hundred dollars, so this isn't a super cheap solution. But what this is, uh, it's a transmitter. Uh, that attaches to your AV receiver. Now that transmitter uh, has the ability to accept either a uh, 3.5 millimeter um, input uh, that uh, they include the cable that just goes to regular RCA plugs. So if you have pre-outs, which of course his Denon X3600H would have pre-outs for the surround channels, you can use that. But one thing I like about the Amphony model uh, 1800, this would go for the model 1700 as well, uh, is that they have speaker level inputs. So even if you have a um, you know less expensive receiver that does not have pre-outs, you're still able to utilize this. You could just connect these speaker wires from your surround speakers to the speaker level inputs on the transmitter. Now that transmits the signal to a pair, in the case of the Model 1800, a pair of uh, Class D amplifiers. So those Class D amplifiers just have regular uh, speaker uh, little clips, uh, a clip uh, holding for the speaker wire. It's not a binding post, but just the little spring clips on there, uh, as well as a volume dial. So those you would plug into any pair of passive speakers, like I would maybe get your Focal Civ Evos back out of storage because they're nice and compact and slick looking. Uh, it's just that they had a wire that had to traipse its way all the way to wherever your AV receiver lives before. Now you could just have a very short little speaker wire. These little Class D Model 1800 uh, amplifiers are very compact, so that could even you know sit below or above your speaker or just kind of you know be hidden out of sight somewhere. And you just have the speaker wire going between the little Model 18 class D amplifier and a speaker and uh, then there is of course a power cord there has to be power going to these things yeah. somehow that would be the case if you're using any sort of wireless speaker but this is a means of turning any passive speakers that you already have into wireless speakers like I say I like the connection methods that are on offer here uh, and I like the fact that you have two of these little class D amplifiers so that you're not having to have a single uh, amplifier you know in between your surround speakers at the back of the room and then run speaker wire to each of them now the model 1700 which costs a little little bit less uh, is that design where there's just a single class D amplifier at the back with two pairs of uh, speaker wire um, connections on it to feed you know a pair of surround speakers but I think for what he described you'd want the model 1800 that gives you the two separate uh, little class D amplifiers so that is a solution like I say 200 bucks is not the cheapest thing uh, one of the issues is um, you know like of course you could connect uh, just a Bluetooth transmitter. Again, you have pre-outs on your X3600H. Yeah. So you could just connect a Bluetooth transmitter. That'll give you a Bluetooth out signal. That could then feed any Bluetooth speakers that you like. But you would be looking for a pair of Bluetooth speakers. And in most cases, the pairs of Bluetooth speakers that you can buy, there's a cable that goes between them. Usually only one of the Bluetooth speakers has the amplification and all the controls built into it. And then there's a speaker wire that goes over to its partner. So I'm not sure, you know, if, if your surround speakers are set up along a back wall, that could work. And then you could just get some audio engine, uh, you know, desktop speakers that have Bluetooth capability. And you could do that by just getting, uh, like I would probably suggest a... a uh, Audi cast from uh, Aventry as the Bluetooth transmitter. I've had really good performance, uh, reliable performance with those at a not terribly expensive price. So that's an option to do things that way. Uh, Monoprice also has, um, you know, Bluetooth wireless speakers that you could use for that purpose. Uh, but, you know, it is the setup where one of them has the amplification and controls built in. That's the one that plugs into the wall for power. Uh, you get the Bluetooth signal to that one, and then it feeds its partner with a uh, physical wire that goes between the two uh, Bluetooth speakers. So that's more or less what you're looking at there. And if you did that, like even if you got the monoprice Bluetooth speakers and then the Aventry Audi cast uh, Bluetooth transmitter, that's going to be like $180. So, you know, it's not tremendously less expensive. Of course, in that instance, you're buying actual speakers. In this one, the reason it's $200 because you already own the Focal Sib Evos, but it's just that the actual cash out of your pocket isn't going to be tremendously different. So the only other thing I could come up with, which would cost way more and doesn't seem worth it to me, would be to 
change your Denon receiver to a Yamaha <laughs> receiver. Yeah, no, 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 no. You know, because yeah. Yamaha has the ability to use Yamaha Music Cast wireless speakers as wireless surrounds. That's an option, but that doesn't make any sense to me. This seems like it's a temporary situation, and I can't imagine you'd want to replace your X3600H with a Yamaha just for that purpose. But I'll mention it for the sake of completeness because, you know, somebody else listening might be going, what are the wireless surround solutions? And Yamaha does offer that with their Yamaha Music Cast speakers, specifically for the surrounds yeah i th you know one thing i will say is trying to you know the, the cheaper methods and there's there's so there's not a whole lot of cheaper methods in this case but the the least the less expensive methods that are out there you know you might want to just go ahead and get something nice that mm. you can then repurpose later on right like i think my i don't even remember what this my article says but you know getting something like the uh you know, some uh, good set of uh, powered bookshelf speakers. Yeah. And then pairing them with like, like the SVS uh, sound path transmitter thing. Not, maybe not, the, maybe not the, the three band one, maybe just the regular one, mm -hmm. depending on the size of your room. You're like, okay, well, I'm going to use that for now and here. But then I'm going to take these speakers and I'm going to move them to dot 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 and you know i mean because one of the things that we've done is we've taken bluetooth speakers and we have used them in a in a lot of different instances outside of course i always talk about that but also like as sort of whole home audio mm -hmm. and the ability to do that to make things you know pretty easy is is quite nice so you know maybe maybe we we don't just look at how can i do this how can i just get some sort of surround behind me and instead think okay what's the long-term goal of what I can do here mm -hmm. with this technology? And maybe I buy what I'm going to be using it for in the future. And now I'll also be able to use it in this one situation as well. So that, I guess that mine is more of a mindset recommendation. Yours are, you know, actual helpful things to say. <laughs> Chris, Chris has a JVC NX7 lamp based projector. It has about 1500 hours on it, and he's starting to see some flashing in the image during brighter scenes. Is there anything that can be done about that in the settings, or does he just need a new lamp? And if he needs a new lamp, where is the good place to buy it? Well, I'm going to tell you the same thing we tell everybody, which is go to, is it Projector Central? Is Probably. That? Yeah, and just look at whoever it is that's bought, that's selling lamps. The, whoever they recommend sell, selling lamps, the lamp-based yeah. retailers. And just look at them all. They're all, I swear, half of them are the same place, just with different front <laughs> it ends. It seems, seems like, because, yeah. yeah, they're all using the exact same template to build oh, their, their website. Oh, yeah, it's brutal. You're like, oh, this looks literally exactly the same except for the logo at the top of the page. Right. So I feel like they're all kind of the same Alibaba knockoff, whatever it is. <laughs> but... Um, you know, you can get some different prices based on which website is currently having a sale. If if I sound like I'm coming from different sides of you, which I don't think I should, but not if in I mono. Do, if I sound weird, it's because I'm trying to take my shoes off because I've apparently tied them too tightly. I see, and it's bugging me. So it's not a doggo down there. It's shoes going on. Not that anybody can see Tom wiggling it around because we don't have any vi uh, video of our faces going on just yet until I'm eventually back in my apartment. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just uh, poking around, uh, going for a. Um, uh, JVC authorized dealer if you want to get the you're for sure getting a JVC uh, authorized product replacement lamp uh, projectorscreen.com uh, does have the replacement lamps available uh, it is the uh, let's see PKL 2618 UW is that yeah yeah that's the model number just super memorable <coughs> rolls off the tongue uh, but yeah it's six hundred dollars for that replacement lamp so it's not super cheap but I can definitely vouch for projectorscreen.com that I is a reliable retailer from last and too. Yeah, I, I would recommend uh, giving them a phone call because sometimes it's uh, possible to get a little bit of a price break versus just add to cart on the website. So definitely worth giving them a phone call. Um, now, is there anything you could try before you go replacing the lamp? There is uh, what we've mentioned before, this uh, occasionally successful lamp reconditioning that you can do, which yeah. simply amounts to putting the lamp in high lamp mode and leaving it there for about 200 hours. It's not a short process. Uh, this is making sure that the lamp is, is going full blast uh, for about 200 hours. Um, sometimes that is successful at reconditioning the lamp and this little bit of flickering, this flickering flashing that you're talking about is fairly common once you get to right above 
about 1500 hours like you're talking about this is mentioned uh by other owners and yeah this this reconditioning process which is as simple as putting into high lamp mode for a couple hundred hours is often successful at uh, at mitigating that so that is worth a try um you know it's, it's certainly cheaper than buying the whole new lamp at 600 dollars right away which would fix the issue, but you know it shouldn't be necessary. It shouldn't be necessary to replace that lamp until at least about two thousand twenty five hundred hours, if not three thousand. So try the reconditioning, and uh, hopefully that that does it. Otherwise, projectorscreen dot com is a good place to buy the replacement lamp. Exciting. Mm -hmm. Dan Dan bought some Dayton B six five two. Another fantastic name for whatever bookshelf speakers that he intends to use a surround back and atmos speakers they come with a keyhole mount on the back what wall mount would we recommend for mounting them on his back wall and to the ceiling so again i've got i got a, i got an article for this <laughs> i think it's going to be this it's going to have the same recommendations that that rob has so if you want to just you know plus a couple extra so yes yeah there, there's there's a couple of ways to do this the, the keyhole mounts there are things that kind of screw into them mm -hmm. that tighten down on them so that you can hang them from the ceiling without worrying about them coming off that's right uh, and there's also the clamp style but those are usually overkill i don't know how big these speakers are but and, uh, yeah the clamp style i would normally go for like on your back wall could make a lot of yeah. sense for the ceiling probably not so much so uh these days i'm pointing people over to mount dash it.com mount it uh where they have a mount that i like very much the m i s b o three uh now this does stick out from the wall a ways uh so it's not a, a, a you know a real flush mount but what i like about this particular particularly for ceiling mounting your speakers, is that it does have the little safety cable attached so that if any part of this becomes disconnected, uh, things are not going to come crashing down on your head. It's going to be a little bit scary because you'll see it drop from the ceiling if anything ever fails, but it's got that uh, safety aircraft cable <laughs> that's uh, attached on there just for, just for a backup in case. So I like that very much for uh, ceiling mounting your speakers. Gives you all of the adjustability in terms of every angle that you could want to move these speakers, and uh, it is compatible with all sorts of different things a uh, single screw hole mount double screw hole mount or a keyhole speaker uh, mount on the back uh, you know, specifically mentioned in there for those mi sbo3 uh, wall or ceiling mounts uh, from mount it now if you do want the side clamping and one reason you might want the side clamping design is uh, for those surround back speakers if you want to be able to position the speakers closer to the wall closer to a flush mount uh, then the side clamping wall mounts will get you a little bit closer these stick out from the wall quite a bit but of course you're going to have the depth of the speakers that you have and in your case, they're bookshelf speakers, so they're not super duper slim. Uh, so yeah, these just clamp to either side of your uh, speakers. Very simple, but I wouldn't use for the, these for a ceiling application. They're not that kind of grip. So uh, yeah, between those two, uh, both are available from Mount It. The um, uh, MISBO3 go for just $22 a pair. So I certainly don't think that's breaking the bank uh, to get a couple of pairs of those for your four overhead speakers. And then the side clamping ones from Mount It are $38 a pair. So a little bit more expensive, but if that's the form factor you need, not you know ridiculously expensive by any means. Nathan. Nathan is preparing to finish his basement, including constructing a room dedicated to being a home theater. It'll roughly be 12 by 15 by 7. And he is consulting with soundproofing company to make the sound isolation as good as it can reasonably be. With a seven-foot ceiling, you're going to have a tough time doing anything on the ceiling. But mm. Let's go. One of the long walls has two doors, one of which is at a 45-degree angle. And there is also a door on one of the short walls that goes into the utility room. So we have a hand-drawn... Uh, sketch to have a look sketch. at to help us visualize... Yeah. Uh, so the TV would be on a short wall. To the left of the TV is a uh, door on In the left Nathan's wall. In Nathan's proposed layout. This is what he's In, envisioning this is at what first. He's proposing. Yes. Uh, with this couch on the right wall. And then there's a... Is that another door behind on the back on the short back wall behind him on the right, like the right rear corner? Yeah, that would be going into the utility room down there. And and then on the left corner where the corner would be, it actually cuts across at forty five degrees, and there's a door there on the back left corner. Okay? Yeah, and then he's proposed having a uh, bar cart just on the back wall, a couple of stools in front of that. So uh, bar cart on the back wall, a couple of stools there, then the couch. The couch pushed over to the right-hand side to leave a walkway on the left, uh, TV on the short wall in front. That is his proposed layout, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Okay. Overall, he's a bit more concerned about the audio side of things. He really enjoys Atmos music, so have... There, is there such a thing? Any oh yes, I, there's Atmos there's, music. You got you got title at Atmos music. You got uh, uh, Amazon. I, mean, Atmos I know music. it exists. I didn't know that there was enough that he could be 
really enjoying yeah. it other than like thinking it's cool i don't know anyways all right <laughs> uh so having an atmos set up in here is top priority he cares uh mostly cares about two primary seats but he wants to be able to bring in some temporary seating for bigger movie nights he doesn't want to be bumping into things all uh, at all while at the same time he wants the ability to potentially adjust speaker positioning and to not have to worry about stud placement and other things inside walls as far as speaker positioning goes so we'd favor he would on wall speakers as opposed to stand mounted or in walls. Yeah, so he doesn't want something permanently in there. So in walls wouldn't have much availability to uh, reposition those after the fact if he went in walls. But he doesn't want stand mounted speakers because he wants to save as much floor space as possible. So on walls is where he's leaning. All right, to start, he'll be using a Samsung 75-inch Q80R TV with no real intention to use a projector. He doesn't intend to even pre-wire for a projector setup. He's sticking with a flat panel, which is fine. When he goes out to movie theater, he prefers to sit within the front third. Ooh, he likes a big field of view. Yeah. In his sketch, if the TV is well-mounted, his seats would be about eight feet away. That is not close enough. Not for 75 uh, inches. Not no, for no, 75 no. inches, my, my dude. Not if you like it that I sit in the back third. <laughs> then you're getting and, close <laughs> and i'm and i've got a 92 inch screen that i sit about nine feet away from eight feet away from mm -hmm. the same thing so yeah he asks uh so seats would be eight feet away so should you go for a tv stand instead or perhaps a different layout altogether well yes so yes <laughs> i think that if you rotate this uh 90 degrees yep. clockwise so that your doors are in the back of the room yep. the back right and back left yeah and then your tv is uh on that long wall the long 15 foot wall that doesn't seem to have any obstructions on it in particular yeah that we can tell here i don't see yeah. any windows or anything i mean there and might then, be but yeah yeah and then you you know you can keep your bar cart where it is that's making that is and the stools can actually go wherever that you want them to go maybe in the on the back wall or something but the couch would be just a bit off of center dead center of this room so maybe mm -hmm. just back a tiny bit uh or maybe even f just in front of dead center a tiny bit depending on how you feel about your um your uh your field of view there so that's that's what i would do because if not you have to move your couch so Plus, right now, the way you have your TV... So the way he has his TV, he has it centered in the wall, but his yeah. couch is pushed all the way to the right, which yeah. means the good seat would be, according to this diagram, would be the far left of the couch. Mm -hmm. And then there would... you know, Usually, you can kind of have three good seats, like the middle seat and the <laughs> two seats that are either on either side of it. Yeah, there's no way easily. to make the far right seat a good seat yeah. in, uh, in the scenarios proposed. Yeah, I'm not... I mean, you know, obviously a lot of people just think of the lengthwise setup, but uh, I would 100% go for a wider than long setup in this scenario that's been described. I completely agree with uh, Tom's thought, rotate at 90 degrees, have... Now, I would put the TV on a TV stand because yeah. even if uh, you go with the room being 12 feet front to back and 15 feet side to side, uh, for the field of view that you described, if you're sticking with your 75-inch TV, now I personally just can't fathom actually sitting any closer than about six feet from a yeah. TV, right? Uh, like just, just physically, it doesn't work to sit any closer than six feet from a TV. So I would maybe, you could leave yourself four feet behind your head. Uh, you know, your your the back of your couch could be four feet off of the back wall, which would now be the wall that has the, the two entryway doors into this room. Uh, that would mean you could, you know, when it's temporary and want to add some more seats, you could bring in some stools that would fit behind uh, the couch if you got four feet of space back there and you could have some, uh, you know, cushions that go in front and, and be ridiculously close to the TV, but it could work. You could you could fit quite a bit more. You This would also give you, with the wider layout, you could have some seats that are brought in that go to the sides of the couch. And, you know, those people would be off angle, but you'd still be able to fit more people in that way. So I just think that works a lot better. Uh, for the surround speakers, you know, they end up going that you've got side walls um, you know, you might be in front of the entryway door, but if your couch is forward about four feet off the back wall, that's going to work fine. So if we are assuming your head's about four feet away from the back wall, and this is a 12 foot wide room, well, that's still, you know, eight feet or so in front of you if the TV were wall mounted. So I would still put it on a TV stand and have it a foot and a foot and a half in front of that. So that, you know, maybe your 75 inch TV is about six and a half, seven feet away from your eyes when you're sitting on that couch. And that's going to get you closer to that 45 degree 
viewing angle, which still doesn't sound quite as big as you like when you go to theater, but maybe in the future you upgrade to, you know, an 83-inch OLED or an 85-inch flat panel, uh, which are getting kind of affordable these days, and then you could have the field of view that you want. So, yeah, I think that's uh, all the questions he asked on that particular one. Yeah. Uh, scrolling down. Mm-hmm. Uh, still scrolling. All right. Since Atmos Music uh, heavily relies on surround speakers, he really he wants a really, really good timbre match uh, for the f- surrounds to the front, left, right, center. For his front speakers, he loves the self-powered JBL 306 Mark II speakers, so we ideally use those and then have an on-wall surround speakers to match their sound as closely as possible. He also has... JBL Arena 130 speak, bookshelf speakers that he likes but doesn't love quite as much. For uh, the on-wall surround speakers, what would we suggest? Um, again, I know that you're you're like, oh, but now their speakers are going to be further away. They're not going to be that far away. All right, your room's only 15 feet wide now yeah. if you turn it. so. You know. And I still think it makes sense to go on-wall surrounds here because your left surround is going to be you know, right next to the entry door that's uh, now going to be in your rear left corner, if you take our advice and rotate this all 90 degrees. And the surround right speaker is going to be above your bar cart um, you know, and, and close to the 45-degree angle door in the rear right corner. So I still think it makes sense to go with on-wall surrounds in this scenario. Plus... If you don't want to listen to us at all and you end up with the same layout that you propose, maybe shuffle things around a little bit to move the couch a bit forward and put the TV on a stand to bring it a little closer. If you end up doing that, then you're going to want on-wall surrounds for sure still. So uh, the one I would suggest to you, because there isn't really a great thing in JBL's lineup that I would be able to point you to, uh, but Revel's speakers uh, definitely are something where I wouldn't be worried about the timbre match between your JBL Pro monitors that you're keeping up front. And I would stick with those. If those are your favorite speakers, I have zero problem sticking with your JBL Pro monitors uh, up front, then uh, Revel's uh, Concerta 2 uh, Surround S16 uh, speakers are an on-wall uh, speaker that uh, that would definitely work. Now, the MSRP on those is $500 each, which is more <laughs> than your uh, self-powered uh, JBL Pro 306 speakers. So, uh, you know, that seems a bit out there. But uh, if you go to some of the retailers, those are definitely available for closer to about $400 each. It's still pretty expensive speakers, but it's right around the same price as what you're looking at for your front speaker so it's not completely out of line to just have one pair of those at a pretty similar price uh with the form factor that you're looking for so yeah revels concerta 2 s16 on wall surround speakers are where i would point you for that yeah and i will remind you again that timbre matching is highly highly overrated <laughs> online or i mean i can see where he's coming online. from though because if he's going surround music and you've got you know instruments actually panning into your surround sometimes it happens sometimes in surround. i know but this, so, the the positioning of the speaker and the acoustics of the room are going to make all a tr- bigger difference than it's all tr- whether or not the speakers are identical i think <laughs> and know? i mean these aren't identical but yeah. uh but yeah the, I, I would be happy with those so he wants to pre-wire for a surround speakers, but he's willing to leave a short run wire visible on the side walls if he ends up playing with the positioning after the fact. But to start, where do we think he should pre-wire for the surround positions? He'd like to avoid having one seat on the main couch being right next to a surround speaker. And if he, <laughs> well, that's that, that's your problem with that's the been his setup. proposed layout, yes. <laughs> and if he brings in more seats for a music movie night, he did he doesn't want those extra seats to have a really crappy experience. No, you. I, I, Get ready for disappointment, I guess. <laughs> Should he maybe pre-wire for, or a couple of different surround positions, maybe one that's ideal for Atmos Music for the primary seat and the second position that's farther back and higher up so it's less distracting for a big movie? There is no world in which you start unwiring and rewiring speakers because you can't leave them wired into the... Um, you can't leave the speakers... Like, you can't have two sets of speakers going to the same binding posts. <laughs> And well, he was receiver. even talking about maybe he could with like a switch in his email, but I'm like, this, this, this doesn't is, make this sense. Is, and if you take our advice to rotate this 90 degrees, it's not necessary. It's, it's yeah. really not necessary. And what you would do is you would put your, if you're like, if you're really worried about the surround experience, first of all, they're, they're not going to get a good surround experience and you're not going to have them get a bad, a, a bad surround experience because you're going to get up from the couch that you sit at all the time mm-hmm. and you're going to put your guests in the good seats and then you're going to go sit wherever else because you already know how it sounds. Yeah. You don't need to you don't need to hog the good seat for the, you know, I don't know, 5 minutes or maybe even 2 hours if you're watching a movie mm-hmm. that 
your guests are over. You're going to go sit on one of the bad seats. You're not going to rewire speakers. Don't be ludicrous. You're just, no, I, this is just ludicrous. I think if you've rotated this room 90 degrees, like we suggest that, that really solves the issue. It allows a little bit more space for your surround speakers farther to the sides. Yeah. If you elevate them just a, a foot, foot and a half is all you need to elevate them. You're going to have a nice wide dispersion with those Revlon wall speakers if you go with those. Uh, like I said, you know, that's going to be about three feet forward. Like it's going to be just in front of where that door swings open and what we're proposing will be your rear left corner rather than your front left corner if you've rotated at 90 degrees it's going to be about three feet in front of the back wall if you've got your couch then about four feet in front of the back wall that all works out really nicely for your surround speaker placement if on a temporary basement uh, basis you have some bar stools that are you know basically on the back wall like yeah the surround speaker is slightly in front of them but it's far enough to the sides that you're still going to get the effect that that is not coming from the front it's coming from the sides so i don't think it's going to be necessary at all um really just the biggest question is whether you want to take our advice and rotate this 90 degrees let's play out the scenario where he doesn't let's play out the scenario where he leaves it going lengthwise room longer than it is wide i mean the proposed placements that you've put in there where it's you know basically a foot behind wherever the couch ends up being that that's kind of the the only solution here. I, I don't see what else you would end up doing. It doesn't make sense to me that you would be worried about the bar stools behind the couch. Like, no, those are going to have a compromised experience. I'm not at like, where, where would you put another surround speaker that's farther back and higher up because it's going to end up on the 45 degree angle door. Like that's, that's the only place left to go farther back in this, in that scenario. So I, I just wouldn't worry about it. I would have in either instance, your surround speakers on your side walls, about a foot behind your couch and slightly elevated so they've got a clear line of sight to everybody who's sitting on that couch but i i definitely prefer the wider than long setup in this scenario yeah it does solve that that surround speaker issue pretty yeah. nicely yeah justin justin has been relying on his brother for home theater advice up to this point i don't have a brother named justin that's weird <laughs> but now his brother has pointed him to us to ask for the questions so hold on to your butts no <laughs> uh, he has set up his theater in a room that's 15 feet wide by 19 feet long and 8 feet high, but it's open on the right-hand side to an office nook, which is additional 15 by 12. So there are stairs at the back, but there's a door at the top of those stairs. <laughs> so the whole thing, there's this whole thing. It's now, <laughs> it's now what, 30 feet wide and... I, I mean, know, the so. nook's not gigantic, so... Yeah, yeah. anyways... Uh, the room is fully carpeted. It's a drop tile ceiling with two by two tiles. Currently, the sort of uh, typical office acoustic tiles. While he didn't install any dedicated acoustic treatments per se, every wall is lined with large bookshelves, uh, bookcases housing oodles of collectibles, comics, and physical media, or as I like to call them, things that rattle. The whole <laughs> office opening uh, to the right is basically filled up with collectibles, and then he has a couple of plush Lazy Boy recliners up front. I love how uh, suddenly. Every piece of furniture in your home theater is plush when you find out that having room acoustics, I mean, acoustic panels are important. And everybody's like, don't worry, I've got the world's plushest couch. No, I mean, don't. it's true, though. It's they, the same thing. It's the same. Stuff it's there. the same. It's not plush. It's not that plush. <laughs> Shut up. It's a regular. It's not extra plush. Uh, a couple of Lazy Boy recliners up front with a couch and an ottoman behind them. He does have some wall space covered with posters, but those these have been framed which means that they are completely immobile and can never come down. In case you're wondering, once you frame a poster and put it on the wall, it has become one with the wall. And in fact, bookshelves are the same. Bookshelves can, now, can never be moved. Uh, collectibles anchor them to the floor with a gravitational pull stronger than uh, the, the, the Infinity Gauntlet. And he really doesn't have any desire and intention to take them down. We're talking about the posters again or replace them with anything else because... What he wants us to do is tell him what he wants to hear. So maybe he should just put that at the front of the question. This is the answer <laughs> I want you to give, and I could give it to you, and we can move on. Not being mean, I've just heard this whole setup so many times mm -hmm. that I could see through all the. Uh, you're, you're you're trying to just you're trying to 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 refute all of our advice before <laughs> we say it. Because you don't want to do it. Now, look, so, I will say. Don't do it. Don't do not do it if you don't want to do it. Sure. I mean, I, I will say, acoustically speaking, this is not a 
every wall is a hard reflective yeah. wall. Uh, I wouldn't expect that if I walked in here and clapped my hand sharply no. or just had a conversation in this room. With all that diffusion, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's this is going to be a reverberant room where I'm like, oh, this room must be treated with a bunch of panels. Like, you've got the fully carpeted floor. You've got the acoustic ceiling tiles, basically the office ceiling <laughs> tiles. That is, at least in the vocal range, going to knock down most of the just general reverberation in this room. Holding a conversation in this room, I would imagine, would be very comfortable. Now, you don't really have much in the way of bass trapping. We're going to get to that here. That could be an issue. Uh, all those collectibles, like Tom said, yeah, stuff could be rattling around here where the bass goes off. And when he talks about the subs, Tom is going to have a fit. Uh, but, you know, you could get museum I putty. I see him. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, you could get museum <laughs> putty and those things aren't going to move anymore. So I don't... I'm not going to say this is an acoustic nightmare in here. I am going to say the likelihood is uh, if you were to measure this room, and this is all, you know, prediction and speculation on my part, but educated uh, guess that if you were to measure, you know, sweeps in this room, that you might have some issues in the crossover region between your uh, subwoofers and speakers, that bass trapping would be the thing to uh, to address that. But in terms of just overall reverberation time in the vocal range, I would not anticipate that you have a big problem. So I'm not going to be pounding my fist that you need a bunch of panels on your walls. I think that carpet and acoustic ceiling tile is going to be doing its job in the vocal range. Uh, but for bass trapping purposes, you could probably have some improvement there. But, you know, that's that's... I don't think this is the end of the world acoustically. That's my take. Yeah, and I find it, I mean, just my own personal aesthetic, this room stresses me out. Just, <laughs> it's, it just stresses me out. It's got a out. lot like, of stuff in it, yeah. It's got a lot of stuff, and I mean, it, it's not a hoarder room, but it's like, you're like you're just like one earthquake away from <laughs> this place being, like, scary. That's what Museum Felix is, in, for? Felix is in his crate right now because mm -hmm. he, he just got a bath and he's rattling around over there. I don't know if he needs to go to the bathroom or what, but my 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 middle son is home sick and he has put him in his crate and he is in his room sleeping. So I don't know what the heck's going on out there. <laughs> I may have to take a break here and go okay. figure out what's going on with this dog, but let's just keep going for right now. So he's got a budget available about four grand. He's trying to figure out the best way to spend it to get the biggest, most noticeable improvement uh, possible. I know you're not going to like what I have to say. The photos he shared are a bit uh, old. I thought it said odd at first, but <laughs> no. both work. Uh, so there have been a couple of changes. He's got a JVC NX5 projector with a 120-inch silver ticket. Fixed frame screen, which is hanging from the ceiling. Well, in the photos, that's a roll-down screen. So that has been replaced now with a fixed frame screen. Although he does mention that there is space behind the screen. So yeah, I think it is mounted to the ceiling. Yeah, but it's a fixed okay. frame now instead of a roll-down. Okay, whatever. It's weird, but I guess you got tired of it waving in the breeze. <laughs> uh, Denon X3700H receiver, dual 18-inch DIY, Dayton Ultimax subs being driven by an outboard Behringer NX6000D amplifier, and uh, each subwoofer cabinet is 17 by 24 by 48 inches tall. So you know somebody <laughs> reads Reddit. And Enormous. <laughs> ABS, just ridiculously large subs, but whatever. Panasonic UB820 Ultra HD Blu-ray player and, and Roku Ultra. Four Boston Acoustics in-ceiling speakers that he doesn't really want to bother changing unless we think it's absolutely necessary. Four Boston Acoustics CR6 bookshelf speakers for surround and surround backs. And Polk's around the whole thing out cs 350 center with an rt12 front left and right okay um for those of you that aren't looking at these these pictures they are very hard to see but the screen is i mean i think it's i don't know that his screen is any bigger it's just fixed frame instead and it's hanging from the ceiling and the 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 speakers are just barely flanking the screen it looks like the the chairs are actually wider or maybe a little bit wider than the uh the recliners, the speakers, yeah. The, the couch recliners. probably not behind them, but the recliners yeah. that are to either side and in front I, of the couch, yeah. It's very unclear as to what is the primary seat in there. I'm guessing it's on the couch. I'm hoping it's on the couch. but uh, And there is a projector. It's, it's not mounted. It's like on a shelf that hangs down from the ceiling, yeah. the, the drop tile ceiling up there. All right, given everything he said about his room, would $4,000 budget be best set on acoustic treatments? By far, the easiest thing he could have changed would be the ceiling tiles. He could also install some panels behind the silver ticket screen on the front wall and some base traps in the corners might be possible, but changing anything on the walls isn't something he really wants to do. So what's our advice on that front? Yeah, so... 
you know, you have a built-in base trap on your ceiling, basically. Sure. You know, if you can get, I, like, I don't really trust those acoustic tiles without, you know, because, you know, everybody, everybody says they're just, you know, it's standard, whatever, whatever, whatever. The base should go right through them. So, Pretty much. you know, just throwing up insulation up there, first of all, isn't going to eat that much into that $4,000 budget because you don't have to buy the special. Oh, you no, know, you're getting the cheapest insulation. Yeah. You can find the the super cheap white insulation that they put up. I would garages, be surprised I if you used uh, 10% of the budget to sure. fill up that, you know, that, that all that space up there. Yeah, so, so whatever cavity that would you be... have a bunch of above your drop tile ceiling, you're going to put it fill it with the cheapest insulation you can find. Uh, that's the first thing I would do yep. is I would I, I would fill that up with insulation. Agreed. So it, it's far as uh it, I mean there's no reason why you wouldn't you shouldn't put panels behind your screen since it's back there. I mean anyway. this is you get printed panels. They can pretty much look like those posters although, you know, if you're uh, trying to get them printed then copyright could be an They're issue. They're framed, Rob. They're framed. They're framed. They can't can come get, off the walls. You can get framed printed panels that look just like them, but they'll be a lot thicker than those posters. Uh, but you can do the trick of just removing all the words from the posters, and usually that'll get you around the copyright of the poster, and you're still going to know what the images mean. So that is a thing. But like I said, like you know, the, the panels that go on your walls are predominantly museum, <laughs> about reflection stuff and more the vocal range, and I'm not super duper worried so you know I, I think if yeah you fill the whole cavity above your drop tile ceiling with cheap insulation at I, least the two posters behind the couch i know ideally at I least would those yes. two we are gonna say that yes the okay. back wall if you can the turn those wall. posters on the back wall yeah. into printed panels we will be happier yes yes uh I, that's the first that's what i would i mean i would like remove 75 percent of the stuff in this room just to I don't think Just, that's going to happen. Tom. That's not going to happen. But yes. Okay. I also think that all these bookshelves and all this other, I'm not going to say crap, all this other <laughs> stuff that's in this room is making it so that you can't optimally place your speakers. I already mentioned yeah. that your speakers are too close. You essentially have very close to a mono signal coming from the front <laughs> of your room because your speakers and your, 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 your left center and right speakers are all within like two and a half feet of each other. <laughs> it's, I, I, don't think that you are doing your audio any favors by having so much stuff to the sides that you cannot spread your speakers out more. Right. You need to spread your left and right speakers out more, and that costs zero. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you need to spend about four hundred dollars, ten percent of your budget, on insulation to go above there. Then you're going to spend four hundred dollars on museum putty. Yeah. <laughs> to uh, to hold down all the action figures and and posters and stuff on the walls because everything that can rattle that's the way to fix it and it's a really good fix mm -hmm. um what was the oh i haven't done I haven't done this i've already read the second question to myself but i haven't answered that yet panels so on the those, back wall that's going to eat up some money because the printed panels are not yeah. cheap so that's going to be yeah. what about six seven hundred bucks you could end up yeah. spending there and uh then if you want to put some on the front wall too i'm sure that's fine whatever but yes that's what I would. That's what I would do so right. far, as far as acoustics. Yep. So should he get some new speakers? He's been eyeing SVS Ultra speakers up front with SVS Prime speakers for surrounds and surround backs. As mentioned, he doesn't really want to bother changing the in ceiling Boston acoustics Atmos speakers. So would it be okay to keep those? Would this be a worthwhile upgrade? He doesn't consider himself to have a critical ear. He's almost said, I'm not an audiophile, but... And he thinks his current speakers sound great, although he missed he doesn't really have any frame of reference. So is this the place to spend his available budget? No. <laughs> Honestly, no. And I cannot stress this enough, and I've said it on this podcast a lot, but you're a new listener, so I'm going to say it directly to you. You cannot realize that the in improvement in speaker quality if you put your speakers, your new speakers, in a bad room. And your room's not bad. No, this is not but, a bad room. No. But uh, when, if you do, the first thing you should do before you upgrade your speakers is upgrade your room, like as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Like you max out the upgrades that you can do to your room. So if you do all this stuff that we just said, and then you order some SVS speakers, which you can return if you're like, I don't know, they yeah, sound that's that much a very better. safe audition. We have yeah. no problem with you ordering them and trying it out because then you can answer it for yourself if you think but, it's a worthwhile upgrade. Do not do the speakers first. Yeah, right. Do the yeah. room first. Yes. You have to do the room first. You know, do the room first, do the placement of the speakers, get things sorted out that way. Then you can start talking about uh, ordering uh, speakers. Do not order the speakers and say, I'll do the room treatments later. No. Mm. No. 
Do not do it that way. Fully agree. Do I think it might be an upgrade? Yeah, I think it'll be an upgrade. Do I think you'll re uh, be able to hear it without doing the rest of the stuff? Uh, mm. I don't know. Like, the Boston Acoustics, I have no problems with for Atmos speakers. You can keep those with any set of speakers you own. Absolutely. And buying. frankly, I'd be fine keeping your Boston Acoustics for your surrounds and surround backs. I yes, don't see too. a need... Yes. To yeah. upgrade those if you're like i'm really not a critical ear i want this for movie enjoyment you're not gonna see uh, hear some yeah. massive benefit from upgrading your surround and surround back speakers it's just not gonna happen in my opinion so i am not opposed to spending part of your budget after you've done everything we've talked about on the room side of things on a new front left center and right because i do think there is an upgrade to be had whether you're really gonna notice it and love it and think it was worthwhile we aren't able to say that for you but just on a are there speakers that i think there's a good likelihood you would say oh yeah that sounds better than the polks that i had up front before i would say yes there's a good chance of that going with the svs's and trying them because it is free two-way shipping and full return uh, of all your money if you send them back very easy audition to suggest you could also try aperion although aperion isn't doing uh exactly the same free two-way shipping anymore they've cut down mm. on that a bit they've got a bit of a restocking fee going on so svs is kind of the last game in town doing the full free two-way shipping and a full return on all your money but Aperion is still something you could try if you just want to audition something a little bit different. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's probably your best way forward is is bring in maybe even dust the center speaker. Keep the price of everything as minimal as it could possibly be. After you've done the room, bring in a single SVS Ultra center speaker, put it there in place of your Polk and have a listen. And if you're like, wow, that really sounds a whole lot better to me, then that's going to answer the question for you. Yes. Yes. Do the room first. He's never had a professional calibration of any display. Should he spend some money to get his JVC X NX5 calibrated? He basically took it out of the box and got the image square on the screen. Not much else. Would that be worthwhile? If that's literally all you've done, then mm. you need to Google the you know proper settings, which should not take you very long. I mean, there's tons of reviews out there and everything else where they tell you what settings they have put. Just Projector what Central they put and ProjectorReviews.com both yeah. have sections on how they set up the images in there. That's not a full calibration. That is not color, uh, color calibrating uh, your specific unit. But in terms of at least getting into the correct picture mode with uh, you know uh, correct basic settings, you could very much follow those. Right. And I would, I would do that. Uh, yeah. And then I would not pay for calibration. <laughs> mm. I mean, unless you did everything else and you're like, well, I still got money left. And then I would say, okay, you could spend some money on that. But I Yeah, really it's, um, mm. you know, I mean, the NX5 is a really nice projector yeah. and it is, you know, HDR capable and all that. And if you've never, ever seen a calibrated image, I mean, first of all, we have to warn you, if you've never, ever seen a calibrated image, the first time you see one, your reaction very well might be, that is it's dimmer too dark. <laughs> and the colors look muted because very often the out of the box colors are more vibrant than the signal was actually asking for. And once you see them fully calibrated, things look muted and dim and you might go, what in the heck was anybody talking about? Why would anybody ever want to do this? But if you give it some time and get used to it, you will notice then how garish and overblown everybody else's TV looks. If you go anywhere else and yours looks much more like real life and just in your head you will know you are seeing something much closer to what the director intended so this is uh i agree with tom uh this is only if you have money left over after you've done everything else you still got five six hundred dollars left over it's just burning a hole in your pocket i do think there is value for you uh in having that professional calibration done particularly because you've got such a nice projector that is so capable in both sdr and hdr uh i i would venture there really is noticeable improvement in terms of accuracy to be had uh in your setup but yeah that warning that caveat that when you get a, for your first look at it after the calibration is done well, you is might too, not like it he brings a calibrator in there. The first thing they're going to do is suggest a Lumagen or one of those other things. Oh, you need to get this, blah, 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 blah. You know, oh. perfect. I just, yeah, that's not that's just another the whole can of worms that I don't want to. I mean, you get really into. don't need it with your NX5. Your NX5's built in frame yeah. by frame dynamic tone mapping is pretty darn amazing, pretty darn that awesome. That would be like the. Uh, the maybe the, the, the question I would ask any potential about. Uh, 
a calibrator before mm. they came in. Just be like, so I've got this is the projector I have. Yep. You know, in general, would you think that I would need that that you would recommend uh, to a you know to a client a video a, a outboard video processor for this like for this projector? And if they say yes, you're like, thank you very much. Click and then go <laughs> with somebody else. Yeah. Daz. Daz has a thought experiment for us. I think that I should just be answering people's questions and not this crap, Daz. No, I'm <laughs> Jeez but. Louise, Tom's in a mood today. I, I just got back from the dentist, all right? My teeth right. feel weird, and I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> and it, it tastes, everything tastes wrong because of the stupid the fluoride. fluoride stuff they put on there. Yep. It's mint flavored. If mint <laughs> came from a, a different plane of existence from creatures that have never met a mint before... Last episode that I totally listened to, Rob <laughs> mentioned how he thinks we more or less need wireless power in our homes before consumers will go for speaker systems that use all wireless self-powered speakers. I, I would agree with that. <laughs> Having wireless power through uh, all throughout our homes has, of course, been a desired but impractical idea for a long time now. But what if we borrowed something similar to Apple's MagSafe system and built that into specific locations and floors ahead of time? Floor stand speakers could couple to the magnets in the floor directly, and stand mounted speakers could have a compatible stance that would couple to the floor and deliver the wireless power to the speakers, much like MagSafe cases with an extension magnet built into them. Now, all of the power would be hidden in the floor, and while it would be, it would probably be expensive for all the coils and magnets, it could even be retrofitted into existing homes, what do we think? He does see, uh, he does foresee issues in terms of price, uh, supplying enough wattage, and the inevitable compatibility issues, since different companies would probably end up selling proprietary systems and network <laughs> with other brands. But if those things could be overcome, does this seem like the wireless power solution of our dreams? There is a book... I cannot remember the name of it. It's uh, written by the same author who wrote uh, John Dies at the End. Mm -hmm. And he used to go by David Wong, but now he goes by his real name, which is Jason Pear, Par something. I don't remember what it is. Anyways, uh, it's the Zoe book, one of the Zoe books. I think it's Business Black Suits and something. I don't remember what it's called. Anyways, in that book, there's a futuristic city that he's describing. And in that city, every surface has inductive charging he's like mm -hmm. and he just casually kind of mentions you put down your phone you never have to worry about charging your phone because it's always you, you, every surface in the whole city is inductive charging it mm. so do i think that uh something like this is possible uh and maybe <laughs> even probable um uh. yeah i mean in theory i mean we've <laughs> talked about uh, we haven't talked about that much on here but wireless transmission of power has been sort of a you know i mean what nikola tesla talked about it you know and kind of i mean it's all it induction work. so that just means ridiculous amounts of coiled wire everywhere yeah. it's, it's it's just impractical I'm not, um everything's impractical until somebody feel, finds a workaround and then suddenly I suppose it's, it's everywhere so i don't want to burst daz's bubble but if this is what you were proposing because what he's proposing still requires planning of placement right if you're going to use something akin to magsafe that means you don't just have universal uh wireless power anywhere that you put a speaker in the room it will be in specific locations and if we are planning ahead for specific locations <laughs> you could put a power outlet there. Like, even if it's in the middle of the floor, you could have an in-wall power outlet, which will be less intricate and less costly than this solution. So in my thought experiment, if this were the way we were going to go, I would just have an in-wall power outlet in that location instead. That can be retrofit, and that could be planned ahead of time rather than a magnet and a coil of wire for induction that wouldn't deliver nearly as much power as efficiently as just putting an outlet in the floor uh yeah. so yeah uh I, I think if if it's going to be the truly zero wire speakers it has to be something you could put literally anywhere in any room and that means truly wireless power in our homes which we just don't have yet yeah yeah, yeah. ascent is putting their kipple measurement system to extensive use their website now lists uh, an update to their signature series with the cmt 340 se2 replacing the CMT 340SE large bookshelf speakers that have been in their lineup since 2006. The new SE2 version uses a denser, 40% heavier cabinet, now with magnetic grills, <laughs> uh, with all new phase plug woofers and a new crossover with updated tweeters and 92 dB anechoic sensitivity. They the, they say themselves they've made major improvements and they're keeping the pre-order price at $700 a pair or 
380 for the center. They expect to start shipping in December. So Daz is now really wondering what he should do. I, I think I'm going to sneeze. Hot, here <laughs> comes. Excuse me. Kazoon Titan. I'm allergic to season changes. <laughs> we have another hurricane coming this way in case mm. anybody cares, but it's it's going to hit the East Coast before it hits us. So all I'm getting, all we're getting over here is a bunch of wind, which stirs up pollen and everything else. Anyways, Fun times. He has very much enjoyed his CMT SE. Uh, 340 SE front speakers with his HTM 200 SE surrounds. He was considering stretching his finances to upgrade to Sierra Duo speakers up front, but now these SE2 models have come along at a much more affordable price point. However, what does he do with all the speakers he already owns? You just be like, Rob, put them all in the closet. Be weird. Wait, <laughs> yeah. wait till wait till they get ruined by a, a burst <laughs> pipe, and then you know, don't rebuy the speakers. Just pocket the money right you could maybe move his sem uh C E cmt i've been probably saying this wrong this whole time but whatever cmt 340 se main speakers to front wide duty and then sell his center but then he just knows the sin will eventually go and update their entire signature series using Definitely. the Kipple system so he is going to need the new hgm 200 se surrounds as well the fomo is really setting in what should he do I think you shouldn't buy anything right now. <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> I mean, I think... honestly, I'm kind of leaning that way too. Now, look, I haven't heard the new SE2 version. There is definitely, I mean, it might take a while because the Ascend is a small company. Dave is the only speaker designer over there, but there is zero chance in my mind that he does not update the CBM 170 SEs and the HTM 200 SEs. Mm -hmm also using clipple measurements eventually he will get to their flagship uh um sierra ral towers and horizon as well he hasn't you know redesigned those just yet but i am quite certain he's going to get around to all of them he's uh, really enamored with what he's been able to do with the clipple measurement system so i have zero doubt that the entire signature series is going to get updated very likely using these same uh you know phase plug woofers that are going in there and the updated tweeter and the updated crossover that's necessary uh, to make all of that work um Okay, so they're saying, in their opinion, major changes. Uh, you know, as you know, the CMT340 SEs, not the SE2s, were already really good speakers. Uh, they're like, yeah, we, we think, you know, the, in their opinion, these like these are going up against $3,000, $3,500 repair speakers, and their Sierras are, you know, going up against speakers that are even more than that. Uh, you know, that that is all a bit of marketing, but uh, if we're just going by the measurements, yeah, they measure, measure uh, really, really, really well uh, with the new Clipple system. So if any of this is a strain on your budget, you already have really good speakers. And I mean, it's exactly what you said. It's fear of missing out. That is the only thing driving you. It is not, I don't have speakers or I am unhappy with the speakers that I have. And should I, you know, go for these or the Sierras, which cost more, this is, I already have good speakers and it's just like something new came out. Uh, it's a pre-order price. It looks like the price is going to go up, you know, in 2023. Should I, should I hop on these? My honest answer to you is no stand pat you know once you have a bunch of money saved up and it's not going to be any strain on your budget then i think you should go ahead and get some sierras if i'm being honest yeah that's i, I exactly say go for the bigger difference say too. Yeah. yeah that that's that's my my honest to goodness feeling on this because of what you already have and uh yeah try and put that fear of missing out on your mind yeah i would not go so let, let's just say that the and I, I have no reason to believe that they're not. Let's just say that these are a uh, uh, a market improvement on the speakers that you currently own. Let's just say that, that they are market, they, they are, you know, observably, subjectively better than what you hmm. currently own. I still don't think they're as good as the Sierras. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think they're, they're ever meant to be. And that's where you were actually headed. So just sit tight and wait until the Sierras get the update too, and then you won't have. Then your FOMO will be gone. Yeah. At that point, so that's that's. I know, you know, just think of how exciting it'll be when you're the first one that orders the Sierra S2. version twos. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just 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 the Mark II version, the Iron Man one that transforms and whatever. Yeah, it's gonna be great. Nick, first up, the free battery backup products that Trip Light sent him after his ages long warranty claim arrived. He wound up happier than expected with the form, the tower form factor unit that he hadn't even asked for, and wound up fitting nicely into his closet where he keeps his networking gear. 
and its five battery backup outlets are enough that for that purpose. So it turned out to be better than expected. On the flip side, the Smart Pro 1500 LCD units that he wanted for his home theater have a glaring flaw. He loves their form factor. He loves that all eight of their outlets have battery backup and everything about them operates very nicely, but they have fans and those fans are always on. <laughs> They're louder than the business class projector that he uses for work. So they can really only be used in a gear closet outside of your theater. He wouldn't want them in the same room 15 feet away, let alone seven feet or so where he, his gear currently resides relative to his, to his seats. Quite the disappointment. Welcome to the wonderful world of battery backups. This is... Unfortunately, yeah. a they don't talk about it because they don't want you to know, and they and they're like, well, you know, we kind of assume everybody's going to put these things in racks. So I, that was my that was the my one complaint about the IO Gear one that I have. Mm-hmm. Right, it is not quiet. It's not super loud. It doesn't. It's not as loud as what you're talking about. It sounds mm-hmm. like because I don't see. Sit, I think I sit seven feet away, and ninety nine percent. Like if I'm in this room right now with nothing else going on except for my voice, I can hear it. Mm-hmm. But once the TV's on, unless it's a quiet section of the mo- of a movie or the or a TV show, I don't hear it. I don't ever hear it. So. And gosh darn it, that's why we like those APC J types so much when it they is. were around. <laughs> Checked it all is. the boxes. Yeah. <sighs> so on the fan noise front, he's using the OLED right now. He's been toying with the idea of adding a roll down projection screen that would come down in front of the OLED, and then adding an Epson or JVC projector. He's sure those home theater projectors are quieter than business class projectors, but his trip light experience has taught him that he really hates fan noises. Do we think it's worth considering any projection setup at all in his case? No. <laughs> i mean i don't if you are if if you're going to be driven crazy by any fan noise uh-huh. i am never going to recommend you get anything with a fan and every projector has one and, and yes mean, they they're not that loud they're not yeah. but they are not not loud and they're if not you're going for a 120 or a 135 inch screen for hdr you're probably yes. one are going to kick it into high lamp mode and yep. that is not silent by any means i mean the low lamp mode i mean i'm a little bit this way too like when when i had my kuro plasma and it had the very very slight buzz that came from the front of the screen uh, that some plasmas had i was like i'm not happy <laughs> i'm not yeah. happy about it and like with projectors like I, even in low lamp mode it, I can hear that fan. I'm not 100% happy. So, yeah, if you're in that same boat, um, particularly if you're going for a little bit larger screen size, HDR is going to be in high lamp mode, ideally. Like, that, that is almost certainly going to bug you. So, given where 85-inch flat panel size, you know, uh, prices are going, and just, just sit closer, move the TV yeah. closer off the wall, yeah. you sit closer. Yeah, that might be the way to go. So he's got an Apple TV 4K and the Roku device. Casting content off his iPhone to either device via AirPlay has worked perfectly for almost all services. But recently, he was taking some online classes and they used videos hosted by a service called Hotmart. Sounds legit. Yeah, that doesn't sound at all like like it's some fly by night thing that it's going to be gone <laughs> tomorrow. Like I couldn't, I, I, it doesn't at all sound like if I Googled it right now, they'd be like, website under construction <laughs> their video showed a prohibited sign next to the play button if he tried to use an air, use airplay with either service apple support said he needed to contact his third party uh this third party to get them to update their side of things but hotmart doesn't seem to have any sort of contact information available again super normal that does <laughs> that's that's just normal that's how things that's how businesses are operated so we resorted to buying an apple lightning to hdmi adapter dongle that function we'd like to know a couple of things can the dongle allow him to output 4k dolby vision or hdr 10 from his iphone to his oled tv the online classes were only in hd and those worked fine but some of the videos on his phone are in 4k with dolby vision so it'd be nice if you could output those literally could test it yourself you could just plug it in sure. and just do it. I mean, but, there's a way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, and maybe, maybe he did, and he's like, did I just miss a setting? No. Yeah. The dongle only does 1080p HD SDR. Yeah. That's, that's what the lightning to HDMI dongle allows you to output. So if you were questioning yourself, nope, that's what it is. 1080p SDR. That's all that comes out of the dongle. So he needs a longer HDMI cable at least 10 feet, and he'd like it to be as thin as flexible as possible. What certified speed does he need for this thing? <laughs> Any. <laughs> yeah, you just need uh, regular high speed, not regular even premium high speed. High speed yeah. So it doesn't need to be certified. It doesn't need yeah. to be anyway. Yeah. And uh, which HDMI cable do we recommend? I recommend Monoprice almost exclusively simply yep. because I know that they work. Um, 
And as much as I love Mono Price, and I do, I, I review a lot of their stuff. Uh, buy them from Amazon. <laughs> sure. Because you can return them a lot easier. Yeah. Like, my, like returning it directly to Mono Price is problematic, but returning it to Amazon, like, they literally do not care. Yeah. So uh, I would, if it were me, I would buy them from Amazon. Uh, I'm actually hope I, I got a projector in for review, finally. It's a long saga. I'm not going to talk about it in the review, but I'll talk about it on the podcast once I get the review. Mm -hmm. But I'm waiting for a cable from HDMI, uh, an HDMI cable from, uh, from, uh, uh, Mono price for this review. In fact, I gotta contact them and see what's mm. going on because that's that's what I'll be using. So if it's what I'll be using, is what you can use. So uh, Mono price, they do have their slim run HDMI cables, which are exceedingly thin and uh, yeah, th thinner than you might expect. Now the passive versions of those ones do only go up to eight feet. So if you need longer than that, their dynamic view ones will work just fine. The power is drawn from the television not from the source device. So the slim run dynamic view, uh, it's going to end up being premium high speed. You definitely do not need ultra high speed for the dongle that you're using here, uh, but it's going to end up being the premium uh, certified high speed. It's $26. So, uh, you know, a little bit pricier than just their passive HDMI cables, but still a reasonable price to get the length that you want. And yeah, the slim run dynamic view from Monoprice. All right. Andy, when it comes to listening to, uh, to music listening at this point, it's 100% Spotify for Andy. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Outside of Spotify, he's tried the lossy versus lossless, lossless comparison test, and as long as the lossy version is a dis decent bit rate, he's never been able to tell the difference. So he's been fine using Spotify's lossy streams. However, from album to album, he's been able to notice big differences in sound quality and volume. <laughs> <laughs> right, yep. <laughs> I, was, I, I stream uh, sometimes... Uh, lately from pandora but i used to stream a lot from uh spotify as well and like the like some old album with uh, some song from like journey or you know uh chicago would come on and you're like i cannot and you have to turn it way up because it's just a different volume anyways. right uh he assumed that that was down to the mixing and mastering but then he's heard about title and q cobas they what pronounce it, it cobas and people saying overall they sound better. Did we say something along those lines, by the way? Probably nope, not, not. us. <laughs> those premium services cost more. He's quite convinced that on a technical level, it isn't about lossy versus lossless. But do title and cool buzz potentially get better mixes? Is there a service where the quality of the mixes themselves is typically better versus other streaming services? Uh, so I don't... There's a there's a couple potential things that are going on. As far mm -hmm. as I am aware, these services do not get new mixes from you know from the uh, uh, from the studios unless they are talk you're talking about a completely different um, a basic master. So yeah. if if you're like okay, this is the you know they have the album version of this. Everybody got the same one. There's going to be any different. I mean, now, some of them do have like exclusive specific albums that yes. that exists as well. So of course, yeah, in that yeah. case, yeah. So, but if it, it, you know, the 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 version that was given to Spotify is the same one that was given to Pandora. That was the same one that was given to Tidal. It's the same one. It's all the same one. Okay. Now, what they do with it mm. at that point is it is, is what might be making the difference here. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, they 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 all have kind of their own level matching and 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 uh compression bit rate and title has the whole mqa thing which is yeah. pretty darn dubious yes so there's a lot there's a lot of things that they can do on their side that can make their stuff sound different mm -hmm. than everybody else now is it any better i don't, I don't know i mean no <laughs> i've got different yeah no different. i mean you are correct. It is down to whatever mastering and processing has been applied. That is and th what is making the and there are there are just differences in sound quality from album to album. Like if if we just had a single universal format and there were no other services or formats to even compare it to, you would still hear big differences from album to album because it's not as though everything is mastered and mixed by the exact same place you know there's oodles of studios out there all doing their stuff we've gone across decades and decades and decades of recorded music at this point uh so no matter which service you choose there are just going to be sound quality differences from album to album um a lot of the you know hype around title and coba is that that is just people buying into the marketing and then deciding they're going to trumpet it everywhere else and saying yeah. oh this sounds so much better than spotify it's that's 
basically a load of hogwash. Mm. If you want a service where there has very likely been some difference made on what was actually delivered to them in terms of what the studios actually delivered to the services, it would be Apple Music. Because Apple Music has their whole Mastered for iTunes program, which at least sets parameters that Apple wants to receive from the studios in terms of maximum um, mastering level and uh, how much dynamic range compression is applied to the master file that's delivered to them and those types of things. So if you're at all going to get something that's a bit more adhering to at least some standard, I'm not saying it's a correct standard, there's no true right or wrong, but at least adhering to some sort of standard coming from the studio, it's going to be Apple Music. So if there were anything where you're concerned on that side, that's the one I would actually point you to. It's because Apple has way more power than they need to have. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. They've got some clout. Alongo. Alongo appreciated our ex explanation of how the official Plex app handles audio on the Apple TV 4K. You're welcome, man. I'm glad it could be of help. <laughs> for his future dedicated home for his future dedicated home theater in his basement, he'll be sure to use an NVIDIA Shield for Plex. Yep. Congratulations. Glad 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 you're on board. But for other rooms in the house, making it easy for all of his family members to use uh, to use definitely matters more. And they're all used to Apple's interface. So while it might not be perfect, do we agree it's good enough? The other rooms of the house won't be Atmos setups anyway, so it, is it even a big deal at all? I cannot express to you how little people actually pay attention to audio compared to you. <laughs> yeah, this this is absolutely good enough for all the other rooms. It really is only... So look, if you're using the official Plex app on the Apple TV 4K, now he was one talking about his new living room setup, which is only going to be a 2.1 setup. Now he took your advice, Tom. I guess you went around last week when we went through that. We, he took your advice. He's going 2.1 in the living room. That is not going to matter one little bit. You're just mm -hmm. going to have full PCM two-channel audio coming out of the Apple TV 4K with the official Plex app, and that is no concern whatsoever. If you've got another room where it's surround sound, then you're not going to get lossless um like true hd or dts hd master coming out but the apple tv 4k can output lossless multi-channel pcm it's just doing the decoding inside of itself first it's decoding it uh inside as multi-channel pcm and outputting that so the front of your av receiver is going to have that multi-channel in as the format that's what's going to show up but it's still totally fine <laughs> so um yeah it's absolutely good enough i'm not worried in the least and it, it isn't really a big deal you, you will be losing atmos and dtsx but if those other setups don't have that anyway it's truly no big deal at all and i would feel completely comfortable doing that in the other rooms yeah oh that's still so should he manu be manually sending the Apple TV's audio output to anything specific, particularly when it comes to Plex, or just rely on the automatic settings and let Plex do its own down mixing thing based on that? Yeah, 100% leave your Apple TV set to automatic. That is the only way to get the uh, multi-channel PCM as an option coming out of there. Because the only other options is to have the Apple TV do all of the decoding itself and then put everything into a Dolby Digital 5.1 or a DTS 5.1 container. Uh, that's the only other option. So you absolutely just want to let the Apple TV stay in uh, automatic. And Plex does a really good do job of transcoding to whatever is compatible with the system that it's sending it to. So I would rely on Plex to do the transcoding on the fly. And Apple TV stays to automatic for the audio output setting. Julian in England. Julian is working away on... Uh, setting up his desktop system that will double as a setup for watching movies and playing games. He's decided to go with the 42-inch Asus OLED monitor, and he'll be getting one of the new uh, Marantz Cinema 60 AV receivers and doing 5.1.2 Atmos. He's going to be sitting on the, the subwoofer, by the way, in case you're wondering. <laughs> his computer is a Mac Mini M1 uh, processor version, so I don't think he'll be playing very many games. I mean, it's Mac. Okay, I'm sorry. Mm. That's just a, that's He might just have a, a game console. That's right. Sorry. So he's got his Plex server set up on that and just, just been using his web browser for all the various streaming uh, video sites. Would he actually get better audio or video by using streaming a streaming device like an NVIDIA Shield or an Apple TV 4K instead? Since we'll have the Marantz for HDMI switching, he isn't even opposed to having multiple devices so he can enjoy the very best quality from each and every service. Boy, that's a can of worms. 
Um, <laughs> I mean, because the reality is, is that this this answer that we could give you right now, like if if and maybe Rob has gone through and will give you say, okay, use this one for this one and this one for that one and blah mm. blah blah. Uh, mm. There are the apps change all the time. Yeah, and it's it, it's almost impossible to say what is it is definitively the best app. What I would say uh, is something like the Apple TV uh, 4K in general. Uh, like we talked about just a few minutes ago about Apple having way too much clout. It also means that everybody, if they're going to update something, they're going to update it for the device for the company that sells the most of those devices. Mm. <laughs> so uh, getting something like a Chromecast or a a, a Roku or a Fire TV or an Apple TV 4K, your those devices are going to be updated pretty quickly. The Nvidia Shield should be as well, but maybe not quite as quickly, uh, depending on uh, which apps you actually use. But I mean, like, I still don't. I have a Roku. I still don't use it. I don't use it because it doesn't have Twitch. And mm -hmm. it, I, I go back and check it every once in a while to see if it does, if it's gotten it. And it doesn't. <laughs> and for whatever reason, it doesn't have Twitch. I, I, I mean, and I use Twitch to like relax when i was in uh, early late high school early college sitting around my friend's house watching them play mm -hmm. uh final fantasy or you know one of those games was just and, and us just talking and uh playing D, D at the same time and everything else was just sort of the thing that we did and it relaxes me mm -hmm. so i need that so you need to know what apps you actually use and then you figure out okay is there a reason to not use it on this one device because <laughs> so you, you you can yeah. think about my particular problem with um, the Xbox Three uh, Xbox Series X is that uh, if I am not outputting 4K video for mm -hmm. most apps, I can't get Atmos audio. Yes, that's right. So I need a device that allows me to output regular HD video, and then so I can also get uh, and also get. 4K, I mean, Atmos audio at the same time, right. and I, I can't, I and I can't do it with the Series X. I just can't, <laughs> I can't do it. So, so for I mean, me, I, that's what I would be shopping for. In Julian's case, he, you know, he basically just wants to, you know, can he just use his Mac Mini as his sole source device? Is that going to be okay? Now for Plex, uh, Plex does have a new playback app for both Windows and Mac. So they're just calling it Plex HTPC, Plex Home Theater PC, but it is available for both Windows and Mac, and it has taken the place of the old Plex uh, Media Center, Media Player. They had a separate app that used to be Windows only that was specific for playback from uh, computers, but it, this new Plex HTPC app has taken the place of that. You can get that from Mac and it turns your Mac Mini into a really good Plex playback device. So I would say for Plex, uh, I would probably recommend just using that. Now the question with all of your other streaming sources is how much do you care about the streaming device, the thing playing the video stream, outputting 24 hertz and automatically switching to 24 hertz for movies and tv shows that are at 24 frames per second instead of 60. Uh, because for whatever reason you know doing it through the web browser on your mac it still doesn't do that it still doesn't automatically change the frame rate of what's coming out of your mac mini to 24 frames per second. Now for almost everything other than plex and youtube the Apple TV 4K is where I would point you if you care about frame rate switching. Because of all the streaming playback devices, even though a lot of them have an automatic frame rate switching option now, none of them do it as reliably and as well as the Apple TV 4K. So if you really care about automatic frame rate switching and having that 24 frames per second output from your other streaming services, then I would go ahead and get an Apple TV 4K. It is not the premier Plex playback device, but like I say, the Plex HTPC app on your Mac will do a really good job with that. And then I would use your Mac mini for YouTube as well, because that's going to be better than the YouTube experience on the Apple TV 4K. But I think all you need are those two devices and only if you really care about automatic frame rate switching. If you're fine with relying on the Asus's ability to detect that this 60 hertz signal was originally 24 frames per second and doing its own inverse Telecina processing, uh, if you're fine with that, then you could pretty much just use the Mac Mini alone. But if you care about the frame rates, I'd add an Apple TV 4K. Okay. Eric, 
How much time do we have left? We have some. Oh, about 15 minutes. Returning to Eric's converted garage home theater, he previously asked about solutions for the image on his projection screen that shakes whenever there's a big loud bass thump. He already silly mounted his projector using the peerless anti-vibration ceiling plate, and he tried our most recent suggestion, which was which was to decouple his pair of SVS PB10 uh, subwoofers from the floor. He used some memory foam pillows plus a folded up comforter under each sub, had them up about as loud as they would ever go. He put the projector's alignment test pattern on the screen and, he sh and shot before and after videos. There's maybe a tiny bit of improvement with the subwoofers decoupled, but the image definitely still shook and all the same uh, base heavy places, maybe just a tiny bit less. So any other ideas? With his suspended hanging shelf on wires, would his suspended hanging shelf on wires or chains do better than the peerless anti-vibration <laughs> plate uh, with its NFT pipe hanging down, MPT? NFT. National pipe thread. Pipe hanging down, hold the projector, or would a shorter MPT pipe make any difference? I can't imagine that hanging a shelf on wires would make this situation in any way better. Because if, if it's shaking the foundation, if it's shaking everything, if yeah. the ceiling is shaking, you are now going to start shaking that shelf, and then it's just going to start swaying. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And it's going to keep can't on swaying. I just can't imagine that that having a having a, a, a shelf like that would make any difference whatsoever. Yeah, no, you it's need a... a a damping device and honestly I, I watched the short little videos that he had that he talked about the before and the after i'm like oh man that peerless anti-vibration damping ceiling mount is really doing its job because yes the image shook on screen can't refute that but it stopped shaking really quickly like way more quickly than if you didn't have the anti-vibration ceiling plate like believe me way more quickly <laughs> like to the point i'm like this really a problem like yeah i can see it it's not perfect the image does shake when the base goes off but i'm like man it stops shaking really quite quickly um but you know it bugs him nevertheless so unfortunately there's only one more thing i can point you i i did allude to it before but we wanted you to try out the solution that cost zero dollars right. before we go mentioning this which is there is a full-on uh like it's not just you know, the, the anti-vibration ceiling plate that he has is basically just a rubber gasket that holds the pipe so that there's some damping to it. This is a full-on counterweight anti-vibration system uh, that is sold by Chief, um, you know, who, who makes really good uh, ceiling uh, mounts as well as many other things. But this is their CMA347 uh, vibration isolation system. And you actually, uh, you would need to at least cut the MPT pipe that you already have and get the, the cut sides rethreaded uh, because you actually put a piece of pipe above this vibration isolator and then another piece of pipe below it. So this is acting as a vibration short circuit within the pipe itself, uh, in line of that pipe and with all its counterweights and everything. Uh, if this doesn't do it, nothing will. But it costs $365. That's why it wasn't my first go-to solution for you. Because uh, it ain't cheap. It's it's not, you know, so expensive that it's maybe completely out of the realm of possibility. But it's not a cheap solution. But if this doesn't do it, nothing will. So that's where I would point you. The Chief CMA347 Vibration Isolator. Chris, getting a bit esoteric here, but he figured he'd try asking. Chris got a Valve Steam Deck. Oh, the thing that killed the switch yeah there's no more switches anymore nobody has them everyone uh, burned theirs in a fire because the steam deck came out that's what i heard steam deck came out it's been <laughs> it's the it's end of taken... nintendo they don't exist anymore nintendo nintendo went bankrupt twitter is in flames all because of the steam deck <laughs> he's been loving it it natively runs linux which is the only operating system available anymore uh, windows is gone the mac <laughs> os is gone as well that's steam just deck uh, took over. Just Linux. Linux and Steam Deck, baby. Linux. Everybody says Linux stuff. Linux. <laughs> All right. That's the that's the, the proper that now that it's it's a noun, we changed it to Linux. Linux was just whatever. <laughs> but it has no problem running Windows. Uh just just to flex on win with on the now defunct Windows. So he installed Windows on a micro SD card and now he can boot into either operating system. He then got a USB-C dock before the official Steam dock was released to give him an HDMI output. If he plugs 
that directly into his TCL 6 Series TV. It works perfectly fine. It's 1080p resolution coming on the Steam Deck, but it all shows up on the TV, no problem. However, if he plugs it into his Epson 5050 UV projector, no image shows up at all. He does have a Denon X4300H receiver in the signal chain with his Epson, but he tried connecting the Steam Deck via its USB-C dock directly into the Epson without the Denon in between. That still didn't work. So it isn't just the Denon's fault. He's also tried a few different HDMI cables, including a blue jeans cable that for sure works with the TCL TV. So any ideas? There's a resolution, uh, or like uh, not resolution. Um, the the refresh rate would be my my guess as the problem there. Uh, but uh, um, like know, something's okay. happening. This is getting a bit esoteric, and my answer is going to be a bit pedantic, uh, but. Have we made absolutely sure that when you connect all this, that Windows uh, is set for either dual screen output or switching which output it's using? Because this almost seems like a case of it's just the display output setting in Windows, not automatically detecting through the USB-C dongle that you have connected to an external uh, display. And I mean, I'm thinking that that you know, he would already uh, have known to check that. But I, like I say, I'm just going to cover all bases because that would certainly be uh, the easiest explanation and the the thing that you could change. Um, you know, like you don't have a regular full-size keyboard on the Steam Deck, so it's not going to be a matter of, you know, holding down the function key and hitting the, uh, you know, external display button that takes the place of one of your, your F4 key or whatever it is on your keyboard. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different coming out of the Steam Deck. So you would have to actually go into like, the display output settings in Windows and make sure that, you know, it is now set to output to an external display. Um, Cause that, that might be it. Um, about all I could do, you know, the Epson 5050 UB projector, they absolutely are expecting that you might connect it to a computer to use it right. for, you know, displaying things from the computer. So there's lots of computer based settings that are in the manual. I'll just link to the manual because it's not like there's a single thing I could point you to on a specific page in the manual. It's just there are lots of troubleshooting suggestions in the Epson 5050's manual um, regarding connecting a, a Windows computer specifically to it uh, and getting that all functioning so i i i don't know specifically what this could be if it isn't just as simple as the display output settings um but going through the full troubleshooting section in the epson manual you might come across something there that that is the key to all of this the only other thing i could say is if none of that works maybe the official steam deck USB-C dock uh it, you know will work maybe it's a driver issue uh mm -hmm. with what you what you purchase there uh, you know, because the driver isn't just Windows alone; it is also what hardware it works with. And maybe the Steam Deck just doesn't have the chipset; it's ex uh, the dock that you purchased is expecting to work with. So I don't have a better explanation than it's that. It's a little weird, though. I, I, it I is. was under the impression that the Steam Deck was a faultless piece of equipment that could basically do anything. I mean, it was yeah. it was the Nintendo precursor under, to quantum computing, is my understanding. <laughs> Like the, it has the very first quantum chips in it. Like they don't talk about it that much. It's kind of on the DL, <laughs> but it's all. It's got the. It's got the first, the Gen One, Gen certainly, Zero. Really, quantum certainly chips isn't just an it. Android phone chip set running Linux. No, that, that couldn't be that. Couldn't be that. It's not. <laughs> I mean, how else is the Department of Defense using it to control all the satellites mm -hmm. if, if it didn't have that kind of technology in it? Let's be real. <laughs> Mark, Mark's home theater setup is in the living room with no room treatments. Get out. Just get out. <laughs> get out of this podcast. You're out. Sorry. Yeah. Banned. Oh, man. He says he'd add them if he could, but it isn't in the cards. Is it, though? Is it not in the cards? <laughs> get different cards. There's cards all over the place. I, 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 I Uno reverse draw for you. Right. There you go. So is he, he's using PSB synchrony. Synchrony. That's what I thought, but it's weird. Synchrony. Okay. Synchrony speakers up front along with dual SVS P SB2000 Pro. Subwoofers first and four monoprocess alpha insulin speakers all powered by Emotiva amps connected to a Marantz Pre-Pro. He needs to replace his PSB surround speakers with in-wall speakers, but he doesn't want to overspend, says the man who clearly already did. <laughs> but let's go. <laughs> He's been happy with his monoprocess insulin speakers for Atmos purposes. So, do we think a pair of model, uh, model price model with THX in wall speakers would timber, timber match all right with his PSB synchrony front speakers? He's specifically looking at the THX 275IW 
model, which is the size, design, and price point he's looking at. Um, as I mean, it's a big, it's an open room. And, mm-hmm. You know, so you really have to be a little careful in here with uh, how, um, you know, th- these are, sw- what are they? S- select? Are they certified? Select, right? Select. So uh, you have to that make particular sh- model would be uh, very yeah. close to being ultra certified, if we're honest. Uh, it's yeah. the same so, tweeter mid range stack as all the ultra certified ones, but a single woofer rather than dual woofers in the 275 IW. I mean, in-wall speakers are a very hard thing to really recommend because you can't honestly test them out all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you can't. It's really hard to just put them in a the wall and go, yeah, well, I really like the way these sound. Uh, I would, you know, Mono Price's uh, target has been fairly flat speakers. Oh, yes. Know? So, I mean, generally speaking, I would think that they would play nice. They would yeah. at least play nice with m- uh, most speakers out there that are not trying to be weird and psb yeah. speakers are not trying to be weird no so they're trying I to be very have, neutral canadian sound i would i would be fine with these as long as they are properly rated for the amount of distance between you and mm. them yeah. um yeah. and that's and that's not what's being listed here i don't know how far away you're sitting so that would be that would be my one concern other than that i think you're okay yeah um yeah i i would be kind of shocked if these don't sound a lot more similar than different they're both going for very neutral flat frequency response so i don't have a lot of qualms on that side i also completely believe in this instance that your room would be the limiting factor yeah, 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 and not yeah. the speakers themselves so if you were to get these and as long as they have sufficient output capability i would be kind of surprised if the timbre match were so far apart that it was really bothering you uh the only thing i'll say is that if you want an alternative although it's more expensive kind of like you know psb's own in wall speed speakers are more expensive but uh, this is a case where axiom audios in wall speakers uh, wouldn't be a terrible choice um, what i like about axioms in walls is that they are uh, just fully sealed speakers it's not like there's an optional backer box to add to them they just come as they are with a back on them and they are fully sealed speakers ready to go in your wall I think they're a bit overpriced, uh, but the Axiom sound is very similar to the PSB sound, so that would be a potential alternative to look at. Um, Yeah, I think that about covers it, but I I don't think you're making an unreasonable uh, choice Mm -hmm. here whatsoever. Yeah, I definitely think they'd sound more similar than different if you went with the mono prices. All right, so who do we have left? All right, on the list, uh, we have Julian H. from Montana. So we had a a Julian previously, but this is a different Julian. Uh, We have Carl and his wife, E, and uh, Henry and Infinite. Gary also had short questions on the list. So those will be there for next week. All right, that sounds good. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank uh, our 139 patrons over at Patreon.com, including Andy. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. That is Patreon.com slash Podcast. if you'd like to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation. So big thanks to our 139 patrons over there. Andy, thank you very much for being one of them. We also want to thank those who have thanked us for keeping this podcast go- going, including Jay, Nathan, Justin, Andy, Ilanco, Julian, L, Daz, Bastian, Andrew, Mark, Julian, H, and Gorinder. Thank you. For sure. I'll say the names one more time. Jay, Nathan, Justin, Andy, Ilongo, Julian L, Daz, Bastian, Andrew, Mark, Julian H, and Gorinder. Thank you all very much for those notes of gratitude to us. The notes of encouragement are very much appreciated. So big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something.